Hexing. Magic and Alchemy Book 1. By Sierra Graves. Chapter 1. Chaz. Glass shattered. My mother screamed, reaching for me. That was always what came first in the nightmare where I watched my life rip to shreds. Metal crunched, followed by a resounding boom. Then everything went silent. What came next was the gentle pattering of raindrops falling, until hands finally reached into the wreckage and pulled me free. I jerked upright in my bed, drenched in a cold sweat and cursing as my head throbbed. Every damn time, I whispered harshly to the night. Every time. I flung the sheet off my body and stalked around my room, curling and uncurling my fists as I waited for the adrenaline from the nightmare to fade away. I could go all year without having it, but as soon as I neared the anniversary of the accident, the few details I could remember rushed back and it was like I was there all over again. Hearing my parents yelling as the car was struck, as it rolled, and then the utter silence that came afterward. I laced my fingers at the back of my neck and breathed in deeply, willing myself to calm down. My parents had been dead for 17 years. That was not about to change. I glanced at the clock on my nightstand and grunted. Not even worth trying to go back to sleep at this rate. If it was any other day, I'd consider it, but this was the first day for new recruits to arrive at Four Point Training Facility. Horrible name, but it stated the truth. Four classes of magic users came here to be registered, trained and in three years sent off to carry out their duty to the magic community. We weren't exactly separated from the rest of the population, but I wouldn't go so far as to say we could do what we wanted with our lives. As soon as an individual came into his or her magic, if it ran in their veins, they had to register with the federal government and the Office of Law in tracking magic. Every magic user was known, and if you tried to hide, well, you were tracked down and found anyway. They had their ways. After my body stopped tensing every few seconds, I grabbed a fresh change of clothes and stepped out of my dorm into the quiet and empty corridor, headed for the showers. In a few hours, those who were already residents here would start waking, ready to greet the new recruits. I was expected to be there, but I had better things to do with my time than greet newbies who would be too excited about the notion that this was going to be the start of some great adventure. Or the ones who let their nerves get the best of them. It was no secret most magic users were sent to the vanguard, the main fighting force of our magic communities. The force that kept other magic users in line, as well as protected us from those who were not as accepting of magic types. I lifted my lip in disgust at the thought of those unaccepting idiots. Just a few weeks ago, an entire bus of the dumbasses had shown up outside our gates with posters and chants, screaming about how we were a nuisance and a danger to the world. What did they know? Magic had been around since the beginning of time, and it wasn't about to go anywhere. After a quick shower, I headed to the main building. The lights were just coming on, and the cooks were setting out the first round of eggs, bacon, sausages, biscuits, essentially anything a person could want. All I cared about this morning was coffee. I filled my mug and took a seat at a table in the far corner. I was more than content being by myself. So much for that. A shadow fell over me. I sighed. Really? Can't we skip this shit just one year? I muttered, not bothering to look up. No, the man said as he joined me. That would break tradition, and I'm not one for breaking anything. You look like shit by the way. This time I did glance up, giving Commander Moran a blank expression. Thanks. Your wrinkles are showing, old man. I sipped my coffee. He shrugged. I'm fine. He sneered. Sure you are. Those bags under your eyes say you're just peachy. I didn't ask you for your opinion. And when has that ever stopped me? He asked with a wry smirk. You have the nightmare again? I ran my finger around the edge of my mug as I nodded. Every year. One day it'll stop. And you say that every year too, I muttered. Everything about this moment seems quite familiar. Give it ten seconds. Wait for it. I watched the door to the hall that led in here, counting off the seconds quietly under my breath. 
A head of silver hair appeared, framing the face of an older woman who was at least a hundred if not more years old. Priests. No one could ever tell how old they were. Then again, we all lived quite a bit longer thanks to the power flowing through our veins. Bingo. Right on time. The woman's eyes narrowed as if she'd heard me, and for all I knew, she had. She hurried over and sat down beside Moran. You look like crap. I threw my hands up in the air. Wow. Thank you for that. Twice this morning. What? Sister Agnes, as she was known here at the facility and at the Vanguard outpost, said with a shrug. It's true. Did you not meditate before you went to sleep last night? I did but meditating isn't really my thing. I'm a druid, not a priest, remember? Watch your tone Chaz, Moran warned me quietly. We are just trying to help. I breathed out deeply through my nose. I know and I'm sorry, but can't you both just let me deal with this burden my way for once? No, they said together. I frowned. Your way, Agnes went on. Would you have running around in the woods all night long as a bear scaring whatever poor creatures you found out there? Not to mention any recruits you'd petrify with fear. And you would force yourself to stay awake. Your mind and body do not need that much torment. But you're fine with my having these nightmares for the rest of my life? She sighed and patted my hand. You are only having these dreams because you have not moved on yet. I scowled. Because it's so easy to move on. Moran and Agnes exchanged a look. You are in your second year of training, he said, as if I needed reminding. And things change. If you are not mentally prepared for what comes next. We are not discussing that yet, Agnes cut him off sharply. Discussing what? I eyed them both. Am I missing something? Moran's lips thinned. Agnes's eyes flared bright yellow as she stared him down. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Nothing, but this year is going to be more challenging for you. It was last year too. Because you grew up here at this outpost. You were raised by us. Did you really think we would let you slide in your training, just because you turned old enough to officially become a recruit? Agnes barked a laugh, one I'd heard plenty of times since I came here at such a young age. I expect great things from you Chaz Bryce. Great things indeed. Not sure why, I whispered. I'm not my parents. Moran made a disgruntled sound. No but you can be. Now, I expect to see you out there greeting first years with everyone else. And be nice. I'm always nice, I insisted. They both raised their brows at that. I leaned back. What? I try. Moran stood. Try harder, Agnes suggested as she rose. Perhaps this year you will make friends. Yes. Friends are overrated. Not if you wish to be an elite, they aren't, Moran said sternly. You know this. Not friends. Just teammates. Your issue is you think there's a difference. He rapped his knuckles on the table. We are all family here. One of these days, you will understand what that means. Fighting for more than yourself or to impress those who train you. My turn to raise a brow. Teams don't need to be friends, Moran, just compatible. Everyone knows this. Perhaps, he said, his head falling to the side as he studied me. Or is it being compatible is what makes a friendship last. Makes the bond stronger. Have that be your lesson for the day. Commander Moran. The three of us turned as a soldier clad in black rushed into the hall and handed Moran a missive. Just came in. They're back, the soldier said in a rush, his eyes darting to me. That look made me wonder. It's not like he didn't recognize me. Everyone here knew who I was. I waited for him to give the report. To expand on who was back, but he clamped his mouth shut. Moran opened the missive and his eyes darkened as the shaman tattoo on his hand shimmered with the rise of his emotions. The tattoo consisted of three feathers braided around horns. The symbol was unique to him and his power. Chaz think about what I told you, he said. The three of them started to walk away. What's going on? I asked. Moran paused. I pushed on. Is it the team? 
Nothing you need to worry about today. Take care of yourself, go for a run in the woods, just don't scare the crap out of any first-year recruits, all right? Then they were gone, just like that. Over the last few months, I'd noticed Moran told me less and less about the five elite teams he was in charge of. Used to be, any time a report came in, he called me to his office, said he wanted me to be as much a part of this world as I could. After all, my parents had been part of the elite guard too, before they were killed in a car wreck of all things. I thought of tracking down the soldier who brought the report and seeing what I could get out of him, but every soldier and commander here was loyal to Commander Moran. For a good reason, too. He was a legend amongst not just shamans, but all magic users. I had been lucky to be trained by him and Agnes. She had a reputation of her own, and was not to be crossed. Ever. After seventeen years of having her watching over my shoulder, always catching me when I got myself in trouble, you'd think I would have learned my lesson. Screw it, I mumbled, draining my coffee. I decided I was going to try and catch up with Moran, see if I could get anything out of that soldier anyway. Or sneak into the commander's office. I was barely two steps out the front doors when a staff crossed my path, and I grunted as it hit my chest, forcing me to a stop. I hung my head, waiting for the lecture as the staff hit the stones beneath with a resonating clang. Going somewhere? Agnes asked. No, not at all. Right. Go for your morning run and leave Moran to his business. He's been acting strange for months now. I lowered my voice as several other recruits passed us. Agnes motioned me off the path and we stepped into the grass. Come on, Agnes. Is there a new threat to us? There is always a threat, you know this. Between the ignorant non-users and those who choose to manipulate their powers for darkness, the danger never goes away. It is why we train you so hard, all of you. But no, there is no current threat. She said it, but her gaze glowed brighter for a second until she deliberately set her eyes elsewhere. When I was a kid, I might have believed you. Ah. You are still a kid, at least to me. She sighed and patted my cheek. You will always be so. Now go, stay out of trouble, eh? Let Moran do his duties, and do not try to break into his office again. And where will you be? At the temple for my morning prayers, as always. You stay clear. I don't need you tracking in mud. She shooed me away. I rolled my eyes and backed away, walking to the trees, feeling the pull of nature all around me, the living force that flowed through the grass beneath my feet to the trees I ran my fingers over. I followed the stone path overgrown with moss and small white flowers that bloomed in the cool fall mountain air. The stones wound deep into the woods and ended at a simple stone altar set up with three archways crossing over it. I brushed leaves from its surface and then kicked out of my shoes, letting my connection to nature fill me from the soles of my feet all the way up to my head. Druids were connected to the living force of nature. It's what powered us, gave us strength, and it was what we could guide and shape for what we needed. I rolled my shoulders and settled my mind as I braced for the change. I was twelve when I discovered I had a rare gift that had not been seen amongst druids in many generations. Power rolled over me in waves as I focused on taking the living energy surrounding me and letting it transform my very being. Green and blue light flickered to life starting around my feet and moved up my body until it covered me. I threw my head back as my body reoriented itself and my yell turned into a fierce roar. Fur covered me, and when the light fell back to the ground at my feet, I stood on my hind legs, sniffing the air intensely in my new form. I landed easily on my front legs and lumbered off into the trees, picking up speed as I went. Agnes told me every year I needed to simply move on, and I would be able to achieve my full potential. And I tried. Every year, I tried. But a nagging voice in the back of my head told me moving on wasn't possible just yet. Why, I had no idea. It was a car accident, end of story. Or it should have been the end of the story. So then why did I feel like I was missing a piece to the puzzle that was quickly growing more complicated with the less Moran and Agnes told me? Nothing I could do about it today, I decided. The new recruits would start arriving, and I would do as Agnes and Moran suggested. 
attempt to play nice. I wasn't in any mood to make friends. The last thing I needed was someone getting to know me on that personal level. I heard what Moran said, but magic being compatible had nothing to do with the people being friends. Magic was magic, end of discussion. I stopped running when I reached the ridge that overlooked the campus and outpost grounds, breathing in the clean mountain air and watching the sun rising in the east. The faint shimmering of the barricade protecting the area was visible to someone with a keen eye. The barricade was strong and true as it had been the day Moran cast it. If there was a new threat out there, I doubted it would find its way up here in the mountains. I'd feel sorry for the fool who attacked here, where two of the greatest legends of our time resided. They'd be dead before they ever crossed the barricade. Chapter 2 Vori Here we are. You ready for this? I nodded, a bit numb now that I was actually here. At the location where my life was going to change forever. Not that it hadn't changed the day I figured out what I was and what I could do, but now it all hit home. I was a bit scared to be honest, not of myself or the campus I stood on. No, I was scared of officially being labeled something for the rest of my life. Scared of being thrown into a life I no longer had any real say in. That just wasn't how our world worked. From now on, my life would be dictated to me. I'd have orders to follow. People to answer to. Everything was about to change, forever, and part of me was not ready to accept that truth. Rory? Hun, you know you have to speak eventually. Mom nudged my arm. Huh? Yeah, I mean no, I'll talk. I laughed nervously, no real amusement in the sound at all. It's just a lot to take in. If you're not ready, we might be able to push it off for another year, but you know how rigid the system can be. She looped her arm through mine, her brow crinkling as it always did when she worried. I'm sure others have done it before. No. I don't want to cause any trouble right after I just got here. I'll be fine really. It was a lie, I didn't believe I'd be fine. Not for a second. But I didn't want mom leaving me here and going back home worrying over me every minute of the day. Worrying that I was freaking out. There was no choice in the end. That was just how our world functioned these days. The system was in place for a very specific reason. To keep magic users safe and to keep non-users protected from us. Technically speaking, it was how it always worked. Magic had been around since the very beginning. But for a long time it was hidden away from non-users, those who would fear it or try to control those who could use it for their own gain. As time went on it became too hard for our clans to hide, and all the magic users in the world came to together and showed who they truly were. That was many years ago, and though we had legal rights and were supposed to be treated like everyone else, we weren't. Granted the system in place now was better, but tensions constantly ran high, and there were plenty of protest groups against magic users always popping up. They called for us all to be stripped of our magic. Or killed. We'd even passed a group of protesters on our way up here. Here was the four-point training facility. I wished our kind could be treated the same, and not be placed in military or government positions. The moment the students at my old school figured out what I was, well, let's just say I went from having friends to none. Everyone gave me shit for it, and steered clear of me in case I took my frustrations out on them. Rory? You okay? Great mom, I lied again and forced a smile to my face. I'm great. You can call me whenever you need to talk. I know, but I don't want to bother you. You'll be so busy now without me around to help you out. I'll manage just fine. Don't you worry about me. Mom owned a bakery in Northern Oregon, and since I was old enough to stir a mixing bowl or see over the counter, I'd been there to help her out. I was all she had. Her parents died when she was young and dad, well, dad just up and left one day and never came back. I wanted to do everything I could to be there for her, but then we found out I had magic flowing in my veins and it changed all our plans. I could no longer just be a baker or stay with her in Oregon. Anybody with magical abilities had to register with the government's magical and non, 
as well as attend a three-year training facility. This facility, where I was now, one of the many four-point facilities scattered around the world. That was the other downside to being a magic user. We were automatically enlisted into the military. Every magic user was obligated to spend the first five years after their training working with a unit at one of our many outposts. That was a whole other issue I was not ready to deal with quite yet. You'll do well, I know you, she assured me. Just remember to focus on your training. Don't let yourself get distracted. Learn all you can. I heard the sadness in her voice at leaving me here, but she had no choice. If I tried to return home and stay there, they'd come for me eventually. The elite guard. And if they had to come for me, then I'd be placed on immediate probation and be watched closely for the next five years. Even be labeled as a possible danger. Magic users in this world might be strong, but we had to play by a very different set of rules. A harsher set. I will, I promised, hugging her again. I wish I could say I knew what it was like, she whispered to me. I'm afraid this is the one thing I can't help you with. Mom could only have dreamed of coming to a place like this, since the magic in our family skipped two generations. She'd honestly thought it had died out with her grandmother, but then I started being able to use the elements around me, nearly froze the house, inside and out, a few times before she admitted I was a mage. She never held it against me, though. My mother, Jody Griffith, had to be the most supportive woman on the planet. After my dad, his name was Trevor, but it's not like anyone ever hears me say it. He's persona non grata in my world. After he walked out on us one day, it had just been her and me. And when the day came she learned I was a mage, her sole focus became getting me prepared for what my life would be like. I still think it's a dream, I whispered. It's not. You're here. And this is the first day of your new life. New life, I repeated. Sounds like I'm never going to see you again. You will, I promise you that, but I know it might not be for a long while and I just have to accept that. So do you. You're strong Rory, you can do this. Strong right? I can barely control any of the elements for more than five seconds, and I see a few people around here already have familiars, I whispered. I nodded toward the ones I could tell were mages by the same marking on the back of their hand a mark that appeared on mine when I first tapped into my magic. A few had cats or birds, one even had a dog trailing behind. These animals were their magical guides, brought to life by their abilities. I've tried for the last two years, and can't get anything to come to me. Patience, she said firmly. Do not give up on yourself. Everyone is different. But I didn't want to be different. I wanted to prove that I could be a great mage, and earn my place in our world. Those who washed out were forced to work whatever pathetic government job they could get. We weren't allowed to rejoin society and just do simple things like being a baker. Society wasn't ready for us to live normal lives like that, no matter what we wanted. There were several groups pushing for that option, but I doubted I'd see it anytime soon. Mom cupped my face in her hands and kissed my forehead. You can do this. Have faith in yourself, all right? Now you go in there, and you make the best of this path you're on. Call me when you can and hopefully I'll see you soon. She hugged me again even harder. I didn't want to let go, knowing it could be three years or longer until I was allowed to see her again. Once I stepped foot over the threshold, this would become my home. These other people would be my family, those I would work with and fight next to. If it came down to it, fighting. I was going to be a fighter. I gulped without meaning to, but mom didn't notice. She nodded firmly with a sincere smile, and then she turned around and walked away. I couldn't stop watching her until she was down the steps leading to the parking lot, and then she was just gone. I gave myself a minute to get my thoughts together, and made sure I wasn't going to have a breakdown. I might be 21, but I'd lived my whole life with mom by my side and now I was on my own. It was a strange sensation that did not sit well with me, but I forced myself to turn around and face my future head on. Chapter 3 Vori Four Point, 
I whispered, studying at the words carved into the stone archway that awaited me. Right, let's get this started then. Loneliness welled within me, as each step I took brought me closer to that archway, and the shimmering blue wall that surrounded the campus, high up in the Rockies of Colorado. I'd never been out of Oregon until today, and now I wouldn't be leaving here for another three years. From one home to the next. I suddenly wished Mom and I had traveled more, done more things together other than running the bakery and her trying to help me with my magic. Too late for regrets now. You got this, I muttered to myself, pulling my suitcase behind me and my small duffel crossed over my body. You are a Griffith and we are strong women. I joined the rest of the recruits making their way through the archway, and the second I stepped through the magical barrier, it felt like someone dumped a bucket of cold water over me. As I stepped out the other side though, I was completely dry. But I felt different. Alive. A charge shot through my veins and I glanced down. The tattoo on the back of my hand glowed fierce blue with power. What the hell? I whispered, quickly getting out of the way so I could examine my hand. I poked the markings, wondering what made it glow like that and glanced around. Most other recruits were doing the same. They appeared excited, a few frightened but none of them were freaking out about it. I knew a little about the training facilities, mostly what I could find out from other magic users when they passed through my community on official business. Each campus was placed in a particular spot where magic was naturally stronger, where it flowed easily because it was far away from modern technology and corruption of the world. I wanted to feel like this all the time. Strong, powerful, ready to embrace this new life of mine. I admired the back of my hand again. Are you going to stand there staring at your hand all day? A deep voice said. Excuse me? I turned around. It was a tall guy with broad shoulders, shaggy blonde hair and green eyes that shimmered with power. Your hand, you keep looking at it, he said bluntly, not looking at all happy to be here. And? I've never seen it glow before. I glanced around, wondering why he was giving me a hard time. Can I help you with something? No, but I might be able to help you. Are you lost already? He muttered, crossing his arms. His biceps bulged, and I was reminded very quickly of the fact that I never had a boyfriend. Never dated. And here was this extremely attractive bear of a guy arching his brow at me, looking beyond bored and annoyed that he was even talking to me. Not like I was holding him hostage, though. What the hell was his deal? No, I'm not lost. Just walked through and got distracted. You get distracted easily? That's good to know. I'll be sure to avoid whatever area you're training in, so I don't get killed. That's not what I said, I shot back angrily. And I'm quite capable. His other brow rose to join the first. Are you now? I find that hard to believe, and you've been standing there for a few minutes already, clearly distracted. Not a good start if you ask me. Well I'm sorry, but I've never been in a place that felt quite like this, so how about you back off and not be such a jerk? I snapped, losing what little patience I had to begin with. He held up his hands, annoyance clearly growing. No need to be so harsh, he growled back. There's a need when you're just standing there, being extremely unhelpful. It's my job to help first years find their way. Just doing my due diligence, but if you're not in need of my assistance then I'll be happy to walk away. He waited. They have you greeting new recruits? I said, skeptical. Wow. Trust me, not my idea either, but I didn't exactly get a say in the matter. I was going to try and be friendly, but hard to do when someone's biting my head off. Yeah well I'll be fine on my own thanks. Sure of course. I was tempted to look at my glowing tattoo again, but didn't want to give him another reason to bother me, so I glanced around, searching for where to go next. I had a map of the campus, but it was unhelpfully tucked in my duffel, along with all the other official papers I had to bring with me to register today. I took a few steps, then stopped, seeing several massive buildings in the distance. Far off to the left was another path that led to a tall metal fence with guard posts. Everything about that whole area said I should avoid it. 
I almost reached up to tug on one of my braids, but stopped short, feeling his green eyes still watching me closely. The dorms are the building on the far right, the guy said quietly. But I'm sure you knew that. Yeah, I did, I said. But, thanks anyway, I took off in that direction. He was muttering something behind me, but I didn't catch the exact words. Whatever it was, he didn't sound any happier than the first moment I started talking to him. I kept my head high and doubted I'd be seeing him again anytime soon. I followed the other new recruits to the dorm. The age of this place pressed in around me. The stone and wood were well kept and the architecture fit the surroundings. I waited in line and when I reached the table in the lobby, gave my name. Rory Griffith, the girl repeated, running her finger down the paper before her. Ah, here we are. Third floor, room number is on the key. She handed over a large, heavy, metal skeleton key. Make sure you attune it to yourself. Right, I said slowly, taking the heavy key, weighing it in my palm. Have you ever attuned your magic to an object before? Ah yeah, definitely have, not. Sorry. My family's magic skipped a few generations. She smiled and waved her hand. No worries. A lot of newer recruits are in the same boat. Just hold it in your palms when you get to your room, after you unlock it of course and let your magic flow into it. Real simple. Once it glows, you know you've done it, then only you can use your key. I'll figure it out. Thanks, I said and took my key, heading for the stairs. It took a little extra effort to get up with my suitcase and duffel, but I made it to my room, double-checking the number engraved on the key matched the door. Room 13. Ha, huh, I muttered. That just sounds horribly unlucky. I did as the girl told me with the key, and when it glowed in my hand breathed a sigh of relief. I stepped into my room and looked around. The third level had a great view of the surrounding grounds, covered in dense woods, along with several massive gardens and greenhouses. And as far as I knew, each recruit had a room to themselves. That was one thing I was happy about. Dealing with this new life on top of having to worry about a roommate would just stress me out even more. I dumped my things on the bed, figuring I'd need something to do later this evening anyway, and hurried back through the dorms to the main administrative building to get myself registered. I had my folder and map with me this time, so no obnoxious guy with green eyes would be able to give me a hard time about being lost. If I bumped into him again, of course. Which I doubted would happen. Though campus was busy, I knew there couldn't actually be that many recruits here. But looking around, I wondered if I was wrong. I knew several of the vanguard outposts were joined with the academies. From the several groups of men and women in black uniforms, complete with the armband color signifying what they were, I sensed that was exactly what this place was. Perfect, I mumbled to myself, not sure if that was a good or bad thing yet. Magic users came in four different forms, priests, shamans, mages, and druids. There was technically a fifth form, but necromancers had been wiped out hundreds of years before the rest of the world finally learned about what went on right under their noses. They'd been an old clan, and that line of magic was beyond dangerous. Many were killed by other magic types, or through accidents of their own making, because they didn't understand their own dark magic. I studied each class of magic user, as soon as I was old enough to read. That had been before I knew I would be a mage. We didn't get to pick what we were. It just happened. Most families were the same, but every now and then there were hybrids, and each hybrid had to make a conscious choice which path to follow and which one to shun. Forever. I was glad I didn't have to worry about that either. I'd known fairly quickly what I was gifted with, but it didn't stop me from reading up on the other classes. Each one was unique, but if you were descended from one of the ruling clan families, then your power could be legendary. There were ten ruling families total, two who ruled over each class. They had grown rarer as the years passed, but a few surfaced now and again. Not me, though. No one in my family had records back that far, so if I was a legacy, I would probably never know. For those that did know and could prove it, doors opened constantly for them. They were given chances to work with the elite guard, as well as the best trainers in the world. They were the ones who rose in the ranks. 
the rest of us had to deal whatever hand life and our ability level dealt us. I glanced at the tattoo on the back of my hand again. It was still giving off a subtle glow. The four symbols representing the elements were intertwined for now, but as soon as I chose which one I would focus on, the others would fade away and a new marking would appear. Perhaps while here, I'd finally be able to really tap into what I was capable of. I came to a sudden stop at the doors of the admin building. Wow, I whispered, leaning back to take in the view. The building was made of dark stone and wood, looking all its hundred years easily. But the architecture was so detailed, it left me breathless. The windows were mostly stained glass, depicting the mountainous landscape and animals within the woods. The dorm had been nice, of course, but this made me feel like I was really here, about to officially become a part of the magical community. Stepping up to the massive wooden doors, I turned the handle, then immediately took a deep breath at the sight of the large inner hallway lined with portraits of all previous headmasters and headmistresses to date. There were pictures of commanders and recruits who had gone on to be pillars of the magical community, as well as paintings that dated back hundreds of years to the leaders of the original five clans. I was in awe at the sight of so much greatness, and doubted I'd ever have my face hanging on a wall. Following the signs to the registration office, I found myself turning down another hall where I spotted several other recruits waiting to get checked in. They chatted with each other, not seeming to have a care in the world. Not as if the moment they stepped foot in that office and gave their information, that would be it. This would be their life until they died. They genuinely seemed excited to be here, amongst other magic users and only magic users. I touched my dark brown hair nervously to make sure that my two braids weren't too messed up. My eyes darted from one end of the corridor to the other and settled on another recruit who also looked like he was alone. He had curly black hair that hung almost to his shoulders with beads and strips of leather woven in them. His eyes were dark brown and flickered over me with an appreciative grin, then moved on. He wasn't half bad looking, and I decided right away that I was going to like him. Or hopefully at least, be able to sit and talk with him until it was my turn to go inside so I had something to take my mind off my nerves which were growing worse by the second. I felt bewildered by the strangeness of my new surroundings and did my best not to do what had become a horrible bad habit of mine whenever I felt uncomfortable, randomly talking about whatever came to mind, usually coming across as a crazy person or someone who just didn't understand social cues. I'd already managed to gain the attention of one guy, who seemed entertained by upsetting me as much as possible. I was a few steps away from the handsome guy on the bench when I realized I was probably going to start babbling like an idiot no matter what I told myself. I pivoted to turn back, but all of a sudden there was someone behind me. I staggered back a step. Hands reached out catching my arms as I sank down and onto the very comfortable lap of the guy that I first was just trying to walk away from before I could do something horribly embarrassing. Like falling into his lap. Yeah, that could count as embarrassing. His lips were curled up in a smile, and he made no move to shove me off his lap. I felt no need to try to move either. I started to laugh at what should have been a terribly awkward situation, and held out my hand. I'm Rory Griffith, and you look like you could do with some company. He grinned and shook my hand. His other arm was busy holding me upright. Still in his lap. Not very shy, are you? He laughed quietly. I'm Brogan Bailey. Our hands stayed clasped for a long moment until I felt heat rising in my cheeks. I was still sitting in his lap. I fumbled to get upright without elbowing him in the face. I sat down beside him, folded my hands over my folder of papers and cringed. Sorry about the whole sitting on you thing. That uh, that wasn't my intention. You can feel free to sit on my lap any time you want. I burst into laughter, then slapped a hand over my mouth when several other recruits looked our way. Sorry? Well, I told myself not to act like an idiot today, and it's happening anyway. A, I think we're all allowed to be a bit nervous. Trust me. He glanced up and down the hall, his gaze definitely more on the anxious side. 
I'm not really used to being around so many people. Good to know I'm not alone. On both counts I mean, I added quickly. Nope. I bet most new recruits are more on the shaky side. You're in good company. He pointed to the back of my hand. Mage? I nodded and glanced at his. An image of a thundercloud with lightning shooting, encased in a circle of feathers. Shaman? I've never met one before. We're not terribly exciting. I shook my head. I read up on all the classes. What you can do, it's incredible. Being so in tune with nature, on that intense a level. You can control lightning, call up thunderstorms. It's insane magic compared to what I can do, I rambled before I could stop myself. He was smiling still, but I wondered if he was merely being polite. And you can't do amazing things? Mages control the elements. You manipulate them to your will. Hell, you get familiars. Other mages do, maybe, I muttered. All I've managed to do so far is nearly burn down the bakery. And the house. And practically freeze everything in sight. Like the water in all the pipes. Mom was not very keen on that trick ever happening again. Everyone's different. And I'm sure you'll be able to reach your true potential here, he said as he grinned in amusement. I laughed. Pretty sure that's what the recruiters are supposed to tell us, once we get all registered and ready to start our training. I swallowed hard, remembering all the Vanguard personnel I saw earlier. Those were not recruits. I didn't realize this was a base. I didn't either. Bit intimidating, isn't it? Seeing what we're going to be turned into. It is, I agreed, not liking how definitive that sounded. Turned into. I didn't want to be turned into anything, but there was no other option, unless I wanted to be on the run for the rest of my life. Or locked up somewhere. Sorry, didn't mean to bring down the mood. Brogan rubbed the back of his neck. I tend to overshare when I'm in a new place. You said you're not used to being around a lot of people? No. Shamans go live on their own for three years after turning 18. Helps us become one with nature understand the force that resides within and outside of ourselves. I mean, in reality, I'm living in a cabin on family land. But I didn't see anyone unless something went wrong. So for three years you're by yourself? Sounds nice to me, I murmured. I loved mom but we lived in a small town and in small towns people talked, gossiped. Everyone knew the second I was a mage. I was never able to escape their looks or the crap they said. I wish I could have had an experience like that, before being thrown here. It had its ups and downs, but it did give me a chance to figure out who I am. And who is that? He shrugged, leaning back on the bench. Someone who does really well at passing off that he's good at being a shaman. He winked. I found myself relaxing beside him. I wondered if it had anything to do with what he was, or with his easy grin. I'm sure you're going to do just fine here, I assured him. Me? Well, that's another story entirely. That's not true, he argued. And how would you know? You just met me. Remember? He nodded slowly. I pride myself on being very good at reading people. I narrowed my gaze, shifting so I could really see his face and those dark brown eyes. Eyes filled with a mischievousness I hadn't noticed before. Is that so? He bobbed his head. I tugged on one of my braids, caught myself, and stopped. All right then, read me. His eyes widened slightly as he coughed. Well, you're just putting me on the spot here, aren't you? He mumbled. Right then, let's see. May I? He held out his hand, and I frowned. Your hand? I guess so. I placed my hand in his palm. His thumb rubbed gently over my knuckles, then he flipped my hand over and ran his fingertips over my skin, sending a pleasant thrill down my spine. He squinted, and I was about to ask him what he was doing when little crackles of lightning sparked across my hand. I jumped startled though they didn't hurt. They fascinated me, more than anything. I wasn't sure what he was doing, but I was not about to look away. The lightning seemed to darken parts of my hand, while leaving others untouched. 
Brogan pulled one hand back, his other still holding it, and blew a warm breath over my palm. He tilted my hand slightly one way, then another, whispering unintelligibly under his breath. Well? I asked impatiently, waiting for him to tell me something. You're a hard worker, he said slowly. And though you seem uncertain of yourself, you have the potential for greatness. If you stop holding yourself back, you also have a terrible habit of tugging on your braids when you're nervous. I expected him to let go of my hand, but he kept it in his, watching me closely. You could tell all that from my hand? I asked, my voice a bit shaky. That. And a few other things. I blinked a few times then, I noticed his lips twitch in a grin. I see, I said playing along, since he read absolutely nothing from my hand. And do you have any suggestions for me, to get over being in my own way? His hand tightened subtly around mine as he scooted closer. I can think of one thing. Tell me. I'm dying to know. You could find someone to help build your confidence up. Let you know that you have no reason to be worried about what everyone thinks of you. And who would that person be? He shrugged, and I thought he was going to let go of my hand, start laughing and call me a gullible girl for letting him suck me in with that damned charming smile of his. Instead, he leaned in. I stopped breathing for just a moment. His lips brushed against my cheek and butterflies filled my stomach. Not sure, he said softly. Could be the guy whose lap you fell into. Could be, I managed to say as he pulled back. Hum, this was not how I saw my first day going but I'm glad it's how it ended up. He chuckled warmly. I'm quite glad I was here to catch you. Same. I fiddled with one of my braids, feeling those smoldering eyes watching me. That lightning trick was pretty smooth. You use that to pick up all the girls? I tried not to look straight into his eyes. His gaze was filled with that growing glimmer of mischief, and the promise of sharing more than just a peck on the cheek. How did he manage to make me all wobbly after just meeting him? On the bright side, I was no longer as intimidated by being here now. Only on those that attempt to assault me on first meeting, he said with a serious face. Assault you, huh? Didn't think I landed on you that hard. Think I'm going to be bruised for days, he said dramatically but I'll lie. Are you sure about that? He shrugged one shoulder and waggled his eyebrows. I could use some help, you know, something to speed the process along. I rolled my eyes but just when he turned away, looking a bit disappointed, I kissed his cheek. How about that? Does it make up for crushing you? That it does. I smirked at the blush creeping up his cheeks. What else do you use aside from lightning? I ran my fingers over my still tingling palm. That is my specialty, at the moment. Though I am quite proficient at totems. For what? Healing mostly. A few that can disrupt others' abilities, if need be. But they tend to fizzle out pretty quick, he muttered. Need a lot more practice. I can meditate quite well too, minus the times I wind up just falling asleep of course. Of course, I repeated, laughing with him. Sounds like you're on the right path. Hey, you're a mage. Don't sell yourself short just yet. I appreciate that. Without any magical influence in my life, it's been a bit rough these past few years, I explained, not wanting to make it sound like my life was terrible. But when you're a mage, and you have no idea what you're doing, it would have been nice if someone in my family had known magic. What about your parents? They didn't carry it. Mom doesn't have magic, I told him. And Dad, well, he's just not in the picture. I hoped he would pick up the tone in my voice and not ask any more about that particular subject. And thank God he did, changing the topic immediately. What does she do, your mom? Baker, I said proudly. She has her own place and everything. I helped her run it since I was old enough to see over the counter. And I didn't burn anything too badly. Brogan grinned. I can just imagine you wearing some bright pink apron, and covered in flour. I crossed my arms, unable not to smile. For your information, it was purple. Ah purple, my mistake. I'll remember that in the future. He glanced up and down the hall. 
One more recruit disappeared into the office as another exited. She didn't look worse for wear, but my imagination still threatened to run away with me, and I gripped my folder until it started bunching. I quickly released it and smoothed it back out. Brogan took it and did it for me when I couldn't seem to get my fingers to work right. You'll be fine here, Rory. Nothing to worry about. I wanted to believe him. I felt his intense eyes staring into the deepest parts of me. I loved the way he made me feel comfortable and nervous all at the same time. The moment didn't last long. A sudden hush fell over the hall, and I frowned at Brogan, wondering what we were missing that had everyone else freaking out. Then I heard the heavy steps and spotted the three figures moving, not slowing down, their eyes aimed straight ahead, not caring if any new recruit got in their way. Their shoulders were thrown back, and they wore black leather jackets with emblems on the shoulders. They stomped past two women and one guy. The guy was a mage, one woman was a priest, and the other was a shaman. The women's hair was slicked back into perfect buns at the back of their heads, and the guy's was cut very short. The amount of power that flowed off them brushed everyone they passed. I gasped, feeling as if a sudden weight had settled on me, but the moment they passed it disappeared. Who were they? I gasped to Brogan. One of the elite guard teams, he whispered. But there were only three, I said slowly. What happened to the fourth, a druid, you think? He shook his head. From the looks on their faces? I'd say if she or he is not here, then it's not good. I heard they were sent out a few days ago. To do what? I asked, unable to keep the fear out of my voice. Where had they been sent? where one of their numbers did not return unharmed. Or worse. Was the druid dead? I gripped my folder until my knuckles turned white. I wanted to think I was safe since I would never be good enough to become part of such a group, but that could always change. Brogan and I were quiet for the next few minutes, while my imagination ran away with me. Brogan stared after the group. Finally, we were the last two in the hall. I glanced up at him. You can go first. I'll hold down the fort. He tried to smile, but it didn't reach his eyes this time. Numb, I rose to my feet and told myself they weren't going to send me to the front lines to face whatever was currently threatening the magical community. It was bad enough we had to walk on pins and needles all the time, so we didn't set off any of the crazy anti-magic groups, but the government always seemed more than ready to clamp down on us if we stepped out of line. The government knew about all magic, including the dark creatures and those who used twisted magic to cause harm. They knew that was why the vanguard had been established so many years ago. Why there were teams of elites walking around, but still the government felt the magic community was going to rise up one day and take over. I'd been happy to live in my small town and be ignored. The people there hadn't been so much into the political arena of what magic users should and should not be able to do. They just ignored us. Here. I was being thrown in head first. I stepped into the office and found myself face to face with three people at a long table. Name, please? The woman in the center asked with a polite smile. And your papers. Yeah, right? I said, giving myself a little shake and handed the folder to her. She passed it to the woman on her right. I added, Rory Griffith. The woman's hand stilled as she looked up at me. Beg pardon? I wasn't sure if she just hadn't heard or if I mumbled my name, so I repeated it. Griffith. Her brow had risen. Yes, I said slowly. Is something wrong? She glanced at the woman beside her, then at the man to her left. All their faces wore the same expression of confusion and concern. Then the first woman smiled at me and wrote down my name as the other one looked through my papers. Is something wrong? I repeated, waiting for them to kick me out. Or worse, arrest me for something I didn't even know I'd done. No, not at all. I just hadn't been expecting you. Why not? I asked, now really confused. I'm supposed to come here, right? This is the closest facility to where I live. Yes, it is. I just hadn't realized so much time had passed, the woman said gently. Time. For what? What am I missing? Nothing at all, dear, nothing at all, 
the woman said, but this time her voice had a tinge of sadness to it. She stamped the insignia on the official mage form I'd received from the government, slipped a few more pages into the folder and then handed it back to me. You're all registered. Your itinerary for this first year is in there, as well as the schedule for meals and any other information you may need. These papers are very important, so do not lose them. Thanks. I won't, I said, still unsure about what just happened. I took the folder and walked out of the room, hearing them whisper behind me until I was out in the hall again. Rory? You all right? Brogan asked as he walked up to me. Yeah, just that was weird, I muttered. What was? I was ready to tell him, but didn't want to make him worry about anything. I shook my head and smiled. A nothing. Think I'm still just a bit shaky is all. Go get yourself registered. I'll wait for you out here. Maybe we can walk around the campus together then. I'd like to see it all before tonight. Right the power display, he said. Sounds like a good plan to me. I'll be back. I aimlessly flipped through my folder, glossing over what was going to be my day-to-day -day life for the next three years. It was all centered around mage training, with one or two other classes thrown in to give me better insight into how the magical community functioned. My mind kept going back to the three in that office. As soon as I'd said my name, they all looked as if they saw a ghost. As far as I knew, there was nothing special about my last name. I wasn't a legacy. I paced up and down the hall anxiously, waiting for Brogan, worried about what I'd just gotten myself into. And on my first day here. Chapter 4 Brogan Rory seemed off as we wandered around the grounds together, killing time until dinner was served at 5. And after that, it would be time for the power display at 6. Something happened while she was in the office, but not wanting to potentially piss her off by prying for answers, I didn't ask outright. I'd just met her after all, and I wanted to keep hanging out with her. Sir didn't want to be alone on my first day at Four Point. It's so pretty here, she mused as we stopped at the edge of one of the many grassy lawns and looked into the darkness of the forest beyond. A few dead trees stood at the edge and she reached out, resting her hand on the dry bark with a sad look in her eyes. You like dead things? I asked with a smile, hoping to get a smile out of her again. I was rewarded with one, just a small one, but it was better than nothing. It always made me sad to see nature take its course. I remembered when I was little, our garden was always bursting with plants, flowers, vegetables, herbs. There were these monstrous trees that gave us protection from the wind and storms. Her brow furrowed suddenly, and her icy blue eyes darkened as her fingers moved gently over the bark. Sounds lovely. It was, but after Dad left, it all just withered away. My mother couldn't understand it. Maybe she just didn't have a green thumb. Guess not, she agreed softly, then pulled her hand away from the tree and faced me. So, you haven't told me much about your family yet. My family. A, hey, not too exciting really. I said as we strolled along again. Something tells me that's not true. I blew out a heavy breath, not one to talk openly about who I was. Most people learned and then changed how they acted around me. I liked Rory, not just because she fell into my lap. I sensed something powerful in her. A strength that reached out to me. And she was damned easy to talk to. After so many years alone with just myself and Mother Nature, it had felt awkward trying to talk to people again. Until she appeared. At least tell me a little something, she said, hurrying ahead of me so she could walk backward and face me. Your parents. Are they shamans? Yes, I replied. And my grandparents. All the way back. She cocked her head as she studied my face. All the way back, you're a legacy then, she said quietly. I bobbed my head subtly. That's incredible. I never thought I'd be friends with someone who could trace themselves back to one of the clan leaders. It's not all that exciting. Yeah, actually it is, she argued. Which family? Orwell. She grinned wide. I relaxed, not feeling as though she was about to start treating me like I was above it all. 
I wish I knew more about my lineage. To have that much history backing you up, must go a long way to show you who you are. A. Or show you how much you lack when compared to the rest of your ancestors, I muttered. She stepped back to walk beside me as she asked, What do you mean? I mean when you come from a family of legends, it's really hard to figure out where you fit in. And the pressure is insane. They all expect me to do everything they could, but more and I just… I rubbed the back of my neck, feeling the old angst of proving myself come roaring back. I don't know if I'm ready for that. When I was alone, I made that connection with nature, to feel how Mother Nature moved through every living plant, every whisper of the wind around me, every drop of rain and crack of thunder. I'd stood in the face of a storm and became one with it. It was an insane feeling, and I'd never wanted it to end. But then my time alone was over, and I was sent here with no time to reorient myself. I felt the connection around me, but in a place where it should have been stronger, I felt weaker. I longed to step out into the wilderness and bring back the vibrant pulsing thread that I had felt coiled within me out in that storm. Connecting me to a force so powerful, every person trembled before it. But I was trapped here on this campus, unless given permission to leave. I closed my eyes and let my feet come to a slow stop. I tilted my head back and breathed in deeply. The pull was all around me, brushing over my skin. Mother Nature was always present, always waiting to be summoned by those worthy of her. I considered trying to reach out to her then, but didn't want to let anyone see my failure but myself. Brogan. Rory asked gently as she touched my arm. You all right? I opened my eyes and smiled, letting out a deep breath. Yeah, sorry. It's just different being here. The air seems off to me. It's hard to explain. I'm sure after a few days you'll settle in, she said confidently. I wanted to believe her. Funny, I mused. What is? How I went from encouraging you, to you trying to encourage me. What a pair we make. I remembered her lips against my cheek, and wondered if I'd get another kiss from her anytime soon. We stood there, simply looking at each other. I was busy admiring the curves of her face, the braids she wore that draped over each shoulder. And those blue eyes that reminded me of the first few days of winter when the snow was just beginning to fall, when frost covered the ground at my feet. They were filled with so much I could sense she wanted to share. But she held back, as if worried she'd scare me away. I was just about to lean in and take her hand, try for a real kiss when there was a rustling in the trees to our right. I took a half step as if to stand between her and whatever was out there, when a guy stepped from the trees, muttering darkly under his breath and pulling leaves from his hair. He stopped short when he noticed us watching him. He straightened and grunted appearing annoyed at us, but maybe with Rory in particular. You. He crossed his arms. You what are you doing now stalking me, she snapped, crossing her arms too, glaring him down. You two know each other. I asked. In a way, the guy replied, his gaze never leaving her face. There was something in his eyes, as if he knew her, really knew her, but was having trouble deciding from where. She giving you a hard time, too. You might want to be careful, especially with that mouth on her. Rory rolled her eyes but a sudden flare of jealousy and anger I did not expect roared to life in me. Had she kissed him, too? Had they dated at one point or another, and he hurt her? Was that what he meant? I was more than ready to intervene on her behalf, against this guy who looked more like a brute than a first-year recruit. You were rude, not my fault you can't handle when someone tells you off, she shot back. I let myself relax. I was helpful. But if you want to continue to believe I was behaving like an ass, that's on you, sunshine. He stood taller, his shadow looming over her. Rory didn't appear put off by that move. She squared her shoulders and just stood taller too. Right yeah that was being so helpful, she muttered and glowered at him. What are you even doing out there? Recruits aren't allowed to just be wandering around the woods. Says who? His brow arched. It's your first day here, newbie. Think I might know a bit more than you do about what is and isn't allowed here. Rory mocked him, and I laughed. His eyes darkened as his gaze flickered to me. 
You two should be careful walking this close to the forest anyway, he said sternly. Never know what might be lurking in the shadows. More than one recruit has gone missing. I'd hate to see you both step foot in there and never come back. Be a shame, truly. Don't think we'd have that problem, friend, I said and held out my hand. How about some introductions? I like to know who's being an ass to me. He took my hand, and I spotted the druid tattoo on his skin, in the shape of a large bear print with vines surrounding it. You'll find out soon enough. Why don't you just tell us now? He shrugged as he drew his hand back. Don't feel the need to. He strolled away, whistling as he walked, and called back over his shoulder, and I don't recommend being late to the display later on. You'll want good seats. So, I see you made a friend before me, I said with a smirk. Rory shook her head. He was giving me crap for being in awe at my damn tattoo. I've never been in a place like this before, never felt this much access to my power, and I was a little captivated. He was a jerk about it. Then he kept assuming I was going to get lost. How do you get lost on a campus like this? I wouldn't let him get to you too much. She rolled her shoulders. Too late for that. We walked on, moving toward the building where the dining hall and auditorium were located, where the power display would be carried out that evening. Whoever the druid had been, I cursed him for ruining the moment I'd been trying to have with Rory. She was flustered now, and as I glanced at her, I wondered why she'd had a look of recognition on her face, the same I'd seen on the druids when he first spotted her. I didn't sense that they were lying to me about not knowing who the other one was, but I couldn't shake the feeling that they had a connection of some kind. It was odd. And then we were at the building, and following all the others inside for chow time. Chapter 5 Brogan The auditorium filled up quickly, and I hated to think if I saw that druid again, I'd have to thank him for the advice. Rory and I left the hall. 15 minutes before dinner ended to snag seats in the front row. As soon as six hit, the place was swarming with recruits excitedly talking about what we were all going to witness. I wondered if any shamans would be up on that stage soon, so I could study how they managed their abilities. I heard that Headmistress York would be giving a speech tonight, and I prayed the rumors were false about her calling out for any legacies were joining the new ranks. Is that, no is that really him? Rory whispered. Who? Commander Moran. I've only ever seen him on the news, but that's him, right? I looked where she pointed, and my eyes widened in surprise at the six-and-a-half-foot-tall, dark-skinned man with a shaved head, broad shoulders like a bull, seemed about as angry as one. Yeah, that's him. He's talking to those three elites we saw earlier. Looks pretty heated, too. Moran's arms were folded tensely across his body, as the three spoke to him. We were too far away to hear anything, but none of them wore smiles. Whatever it was, I had no doubt it was the reason why there were only three there and not four as there usually would be. It was extremely rare to have an elite guard team made up of just three, forcing them to compensate power for lacking a fourth. Moran pinched the bridge of his nose, his lips moving. Then the other three stormed away, and he was glaring after them. Seems like trouble, I murmured. Why do you think he's here? It's an outpost, remember? He might be here looking for third years who will move on to elite training once they're finished, see who will become the next group. As far as I knew, each of the four point training facilities on every continent would put forth at least one new elite guard team every three years. In addition to that, turning out new recruits who had to serve a mandatory five years in the vanguard. The elite teams were highly trained and had to work as a single unit in times of crisis to fight against the darkness in the world. This included putting down other magic users if need be. When they reached a certain age or they were all killed, they retired and the groups behind them would simply move up the ranks. But lately, there'd been very few updates on the new teams being formed. The three we just saw talking to Moran had been older than I expected. Thirties, maybe forties. There should have been much younger ones walking around here. I was fairly certain five teams were meant to be here too, but had yet to catch sight of them. I wondered if they were out on missions, and if that had anything to do with why the three had looked so ticked off. 
instinct told something was going on. Moran, he's in charge of the elites? All of them. Rory asked. He is. He gets the last say too in who is chosen. Huh. Glad I won't have to worry about that. Don't think I'll ever be strong enough. I kept my mouth shut on that one for several reasons. I had more than a legacy name to live up to, and I wished Moran was not here on the first day. I glanced around the auditorium. Most of the seats were filled up, and I assumed we'd be starting soon. Moran walked toward the stage and the lights dimmed. Was he going to talk, too? The hall fell silent as a single spotlight illuminated a woman with bright red hair, sporting a mage tattoo representing fire on her right hand and a cheery smile on her face. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to another year at this four-point training facility. Applause greeted her words, and she held up her hands to settle everyone back down. And a sincere welcome to our fresh batch of recruits. Though the next three years will be the most difficult you have faced so far in your lives, I want you to know that we all support one another. We work as a team, as a family, and none of you should ever feel you are alone. A family, huh? Someone should have a talk with that druid about being a bit more welcoming to his new family members. I clapped, along with everyone else, holding my breath and praying that would be the end of it. Before we begin the display of magic for the first-year recruits to witness what prior-year recruits have accomplished during their time here, we have a special guest this evening who would like to say a few words. Please extend a hearty welcome to Commander Moran, everyone. Along with the clapping as Commander Moran appeared on stage, I heard mutterings and whispers about his being here. This told me that his giving a speech on the first day was not part of the normal routine. He stood before the microphone and raised his hands for silence, then looked over the crowd. His eyes lingered on someone a few rows back, then turned to a few others. When his gaze moved again, I'd have sworn he was staring at me. His eyes narrowed slightly as I hunkered down in my seat, willing him to get to talking and leave me be. Finally, he adjusted the mic, giving us all a good view of the shaman tattoo on his hand, and cleared his throat. Now then, first, I would like to thank Headmistress York for an exceptional job. As always, he bowed his head to her. And second, I would like it known that for the first four months of this year, I will be remaining at this outpost, keeping a close eye out for any recruit who shows potential for joining the elite guard. Any? I whispered, confused. What does that mean? Rory asked. What I mean, Moran went on as if he'd heard us, is that any recruit, whether first, second or third year, will have the opportunity to join our ranks. That has never happened before. I breathed to Rory who looked perplexed and a bit frightened. First years are barely trained enough to hold their own. What's the reason? Rory was staring at the stage, as if Moran was suddenly going to point his finger at her and tell her she'd been chosen already. She nudged me with her elbow. Brogan. I don't know. I wondered if it had to do with why that team we saw was so much older than I'd expected. I thought the news had been positive of late, but from the way Moran's jaw was set, either someone had been covering up what was really going on in our magical communities, or they lacked the information needed to make accurate reports. There were always the anti-magic protests and the groups wanting to shut down the training facilities, kick us out of the country, but it hadn't been violent in years. There should have been no reason to consider them a credible threat. Every now and then, even my community in South Dakota had to deal with the occasional group or two that would come and yell at us, protest outside our businesses or our homes. We'd gotten accustomed to them and went on about our business. But what Moran was telling was us was setting a new precedent, and my gut told me this was just the beginning of changes to come. I had no doubt that that the three years I'd hoped would be smooth sailing here would be more difficult with Moran hovering, ready to snatch us away at a moment's notice. I don't want this announcement to put pressure on anyone, Moran went on, though it was too late for that. But I do want you to keep this opportunity in mind, as you go through your training. He clapped his hands once and smiled, though it didn't reach his eyes. Now then, I believe you are here to witness the accomplishments of your peers or as I like to call them, your new family. 
I will take up no more time and turn the stage over to them. He stepped back into the shadows, and the lights came up as a recruit stepped forward. I did my best to pay attention to the mage as he displayed his use of fire and water, creating an intricate meld between the two while they flourished around him. Most mages chose just one element to focus on, but he worked proficiently with two. He used a dark wooden staff as his focus, and I found myself drawn in, lost in the hypnotic movements of his power. Rory's eyes were wide in awe, leaning forward in her seat to catch every movement the mage made. I was impressed, but my thoughts drifted back to the announcement Moran made. And the way he'd zeroed in on me, as if he already made up his mind on who he was going to try to drag into his elite guard. The mage left the stage and was replaced by a priest. Many priests dealt with healing and rejuvenation, as did this one. He was good, calling on his holy light to illuminate the entire room, leaving everyone feeling refreshed. Two more priests followed the first, both of them also focused on healing. As they ended, I joined the rest of the auditorium in clapping, then I wondered if there was a chance I could sneak out and head back to my dorm for the rest of the night. All thoughts of my leaving vanished when the next recruit took the stage. He didn't even have to show me his tattoo for me to know he was a shaman. I sat up straighter, intrigued, though he said nothing at all. He raised his hands over his head and shut his eyes. Instantly, I felt the tug of nature grow exponentially in the auditorium. I gripped the arms of my seat. Suddenly, I saw myself outside in the middle of the field that had been my home for years. Thunderheads towered above, and lightning split the sky calling to me. Raindrops fell upon my face and I flinched, reaching up to feel if there were actual water drops. When a hand reached out for mine, I blinked and found myself back inside the auditorium, looking around in confusion. Brogan. Rory's hand still gripped mine. That was incredible, I whispered, staring up at the shaman on stage. What did he do? What do you mean? You didn't see that? She shook her head. No. Well, I mean I saw the storm he called up and that was insane, but your eyes turned gray like they were filled with the storm too. You didn't look like you were here. I wasn't. Not really. I told her, memorizing the shaman's face so I could track him down later and if nothing else thank him for taking me back to a moment I'd lost. I knew some recruits were willing to tutor first years, and wondered if he'd be open to showing me some tricks. It's hard to explain, but whatever he did, I feel better than I have in days. She still looked worried, but someone else was coming up on stage and we returned our focus there. Until we both saw who it was. She groaned. Seriously? Of course, he's going to show off. The druid took center stage, not looking particularly happy to be up there. Then the lights went out completely. I thought maybe we'd run out of time, and he was getting kicked off the stage. I squinted, attempting to find his shape in the darkness. The longer I looked, the more I saw a green and blue glow pulsing to life. I nudged Rory, wondering if it was my eyes playing tricks or if she saw it too. She nodded slowly, tilting her head studying it when the colors burst to life, swirling and swarming the stage until they flowed off like water running over the edge of the of the raised platform. When it reached us, it crashed into our legs, rising up higher, and I watched amazed as small white and bright purple flowers burst to life covering the entire floor of the auditorium with thick green moss. I hated to say how impressed I was by this level of magic, but damn it, I was awestruck. The green and blue light swirled into a vortex, and just as it reached its highest point, a roar shattered the air. The roar of a massive beast. Heavy thuds sounded on the stage's wooden floor, and when the light parted, the giant form of a bear, fur marked with druidic designs, stood before us. The bear reared back on its hind legs and roared again, making most of the recruits in the front row jump, pushing back as far as they could in their seats. He's a bear, Rory whispered in disbelief beside me. Holy shit. Yeah, that's a. Damn, I muttered, not sure what else to say as the druid, still in bear form, approached the edge of the stage and roared one final time. Back in the day, long, long ago, druids were easily able to take the form of an animal. In this modern day and age though, it was rare to find one who was able to perform such powerful magic. He raised up on his hind legs again, 
and the swirling vortex of light surrounded him once more. When it parted this time, the guy was back. Someone turned the lights back on. He bowed from the waist as the stunned audience broke out in applause and cheers. Headmistress York and Commander Moran were clapping as they joined him on stage, both beaming at him as he shook their hands. And that, recruits, is just a taste of what you will soon be able to do here, Moran announced over the cheering. Well done. Well done indeed. Everyone stood up, and I joined them, unable to look away from the druid, who was still not smiling or seeming at all pleased with his own display. His gaze roamed over the crowd. I felt Rory stiffen beside me. I watched him closely. He was studying at her, that same flicker of recognition in his expression. Moran said something to him, and though the druid's lips thinned, he gave a firm nod then left the stage. The show, it seemed, was over. The flowers. Rory pointed at our feet, they're still here. Is that possible? She bent down and plucked one of the purple ones, bringing it to her nose. She sniffed it. I didn't even have to ask if it was genuine or not, judging from the shocked look on her face. Real they're all real. I read about druids being powerful, but this is incredible. Whoever the druid was, he had to be a legacy. That was the only explanation I had for the magic he just performed. A legacy, and a third-year recruit. If Moran was here to find new members for his elite guard, that druid would definitely be a part of it. Rory was admiring the flower she'd picked, seeming lost in thought, when the very druid in question approached. His face was set and his jaw clenched. He glanced up to the stage briefly and cursed low with his growling voice. Moran was watching us intensely as if waiting for something. What? I hadn't the slightest idea. Glad you took my advice, the druid said. About getting good seats, I mean. Same. Rory twirled the flower between her fingers as she shook her head. I hate to say it, that was amazing. Really? Thank you. He shifted his weight, glancing toward the stage again, eyes narrowed. He looked like talking to us was the last thing he wanted to be doing. Had Moran put him up to this? Why? Are you a legacy? I asked, trying to figure out who this druid was. You have to be, right? He shrugged. Do I? Your magical ability and strength don't just come from being a legacy. They come from up here, he said, pointing to his head, and here. What you believe, he added, pressing his hand to his chest. I wanted to laugh in his face, but he wasn't an ass about it. He was serious. Do we get to know your name now, at least? Rory asked. He hesitated, but sighed heavily and gave in. Chaz Bryce, second year recruit. He held out his hand for hers. She glanced at it for a second as if waiting for him to say something snarky, but finally took it. Rory Griffith. His eyes narrowed slightly, but Rory didn't seem to catch the movement, busy twirling the bloom in her fingers. She asked him about his bear form, how he knew he could do it, since so many druids couldn't. I was intrigued and wanted to hear, but the auditorium was emptying around us. Chaz looked to the stage, then sighed in relief. I noticed Moran and York were gone. As much as I would love to stay and talk, tomorrow is the first day of training for you two, and I would suggest getting as much sleep as you can. What? And you don't need sleep? I asked. He turned to look at me, and I sensed the barely held back growl he wanted to unleash. Oh, I do too. Trust me. That damn trick takes a lot out of me. I'm surprised I'm still standing, honestly. A bit of the growl slipped through in his last remark, and his eyes flared with green and blue power, sounding as if showing off so much power was not what he wanted to do at all. Too bad you aren't a mage. You could help me out, Rory muttered. Chaz glanced at her, as if being a tutor was the last thing he would ever consider being. There are plenty of other recruits here on campus who wouldn't mind taking a first year under their wing. I am not one of them, I'm afraid. For a second it seemed he wanted to say more, but the auditorium was nearly empty, and he looked as if he wanted to escape. Enjoy your time on campus, Brogan Rory. He stalked away. It seemed fitting he turned into a bear. He looked like one even now, 
as he lumbered off through the doors and disappeared. You think he'd be happy with what he just did, Rory said. Wonder why he decides to be such a brooding ass. Sure he has his reasons, I remarked, unable to stop the jealousy rising up within me as she kept her gaze on Chaz until he was out of sight. Today had been strange if nothing else, but considering it was the first official day of my return to society, I mentally patted myself on the back for not hiding in a corner somewhere. Or not showing how annoyed I was that Chaz had to come over to talk to us when he clearly didn't want to be there. I decided to leave now, before I messed up, how well this day turned out would be a good idea. I'm going to head to my dorm for the night, I told Rory, faking a yawn. I'll see you in the morning. Oh okay, she said slowly. Night then. I walked away, telling myself I wasn't here to do anything except train and become another grand shaman like my parents and so on, down the line. And sadly, I knew I had the potential for being chosen as one of the elite guard, unless I managed to mess up bad enough. Doubt that would happen. Instinct would stop me. The shaman who'd been up on stage, had helped me get back some of my determination to reconnect with nature, as I had during that storm. Find out what I was capable of, and rekindle the sense of knowing myself fully. Being involved with someone this soon in the game, might lead to more problems than any benefits it would give me. Though, the idea of not talking with Rory, or worse, of seeing her with Chaz, had me grunting curses until I was walking faster to get away from the crowd. Once I was outside, I paused, taking in the cool night air and the stars overhead. I shut my eyes and imagined that storm brewing over my head, felt the ghost of rain running down my face. Perhaps I wasn't as lost from nature as I first thought. Brogan. I turned around, to find Rory hurrying to catch up. No you said you were turning in, but I, uh, I was just wondering. She trailed off, seeming nervous standing beside me. Then she took a deep breath and went on. You mind if I join you, walking back to the dorms, I mean. I waited for a beat, then grinned. Nah. I don't mind at all. Interesting first day, don't you think? But by all accounts, it could have been a lot worse. And the power display was, intimidating. She laughed. Just a bit. Inspiring too. But yeah, definitely intimidating. Don't sound too down on yourself just yet. You're just getting started. I know, doesn't help though that Moran is here looking for recruits. You think there's something bad going on they're not telling us about. I'd have put money on it. Not sure, but speculating probably won't do us any good. Good point. I do have a horrible imagination that sort of just, she used her hands to make a blowing up motion. Like that. The worst is always what I wind up being stuck with. Guess that's something we'll have to work on. We. Oui. Her brow rose as she came to a stop. I did the same, facing her, not even sure why I said that either. Ever since she fell into my lap, I was stuck on this woman, wanting to know every last damn thing about her and ready to do what I could to chase away her lack of confidence. She didn't have those years alone in the wilderness to figure out her powers as I did. If nothing else, I could at least be a friend, help guide her, give her a boost of morale now and again. Or. I glanced around, waiting for Chaz to show up and interrupt us again, but we were mostly alone on the grounds. Yes. We. Oui. I leaned in, then stopped halfway, wondering what she would do. Just as I thought maybe I'd read the signals wrong, she stood on her toes and her lips brushed across mine softly, then she stepped back, her cheeks flushed. She nibbled her bottom lip, tugging on one of her braids as she took another step backward. Right, I, um, I look forward to that then. Night Brogan, she said in a rush and walked off toward the dorms. The women stayed in one dorm, and the guys another. Too bad too. I would have liked to walk her all the way to her door. I stayed where I was for the longest time, imagining what tomorrow would be like when I bumped into Rory again. I thought you were turning in for the night, lover boy. Chaz was approaching. I shoved my hands in my pockets as I released an exaggerated breath. I am. Had to have a proper good night first. I see that. You two known each other long. Just met today. 
sort of fell into my lap. Interesting. Do you know her? I turned to see his reaction to my question. Nah, just met her today, exactly like you. Except my first encounter was clearly not as pleasant. Nor the second. Or third. You say that, but there's something in your eyes that says different, I said bluntly. Like you have met her before, and you aren't sure you can blame her for her reaction to you. Maybe she doesn't respond well to dipshits. He stared at me, as if I was speaking a different language. I'm sorry what? About which part? The first, he growled. You know Rory, I repeated slowly. I saw it when you were talking to her. But he was already shaking his head. I have no idea what you're talking about. Never seen her before, until today. He said it, I heard the words, but the twitch to his eye said he was didn't even believe what he was telling me. Why? Did she say something to you? Nah. Nothing. His face was back to that scowl as he held up his hands. Then I'm not sure what you're looking for man, but I've never seen her before. But best of luck with that. I watched him walk away, but he didn't aim for the guy's dorm. Part of me was almost curious enough to follow him and see where he headed instead, but I resisted the urge. Chaz was as tall as me, but he was solid muscle. And if he shifted into bear form, I wouldn't stand a chance in hell. I let it go, and decided I would do my best to get some rest while I could. I contented myself with thinking about my kiss with Rory again. And wondering when I'd get to have another. This week was probably going to be crazy, but I'd make time to see her. Somehow. Chapter 6 Chaz I walked until I could slip into a copse of trees where I waited for Brogan to be on his way. Why had he asked me that about Rory? Why would I know her? From where? I hardly ever left this campus. And that's how it had been for the last 17 years of my life. Everyone I met since the accident had come here either as a recruit or as a commander. I'd even had the chance to meet and train beneath many of the elite guards, knew their families. As for Rory, I was sure I'd remember a set of eyes like that. I wandered slowly through the trees, letting my fingers brush over bushes and trunks as I pondered how upset Agnes was going to be with me. She'd said she was going to be in the auditorium tonight, but I hadn't seen her. I hadn't intended to go on that stage, but Moran had thrown me out there at the last second. I'd been ready to do a simple trick and then disappear, but he insisted I show my bear form. I had wanted to yell at him, but making a scene was not my style. I'd give him shit for it later, one way or another, as would Agnes, I had no doubt. She hated show-offs, and that's exactly what I felt I did. As I moved through campus, leaving the sanctuary of the trees, nothing but stars and a few wisps of white clouds overhead, I held my hands out to my sides toward the grass. Vines and flowers bloomed, leaving a trail where I walked. My power flourished here over the years, giving me a chance to tap into the well that took most magic users decades to unleash. Not me. Commander Moran was more than just a commander in my eyes. He'd done so much for me, when any normal person would have shipped me off to an orphanage. Not him. He brought me here after the accident that took my parents. Brought me here and taught me. As did Agnes. It was one of the reasons I'd given in about the stage and done what he asked, but I knew the shit he would catch from Agnes once she figured out what I'd done tonight. I reached the supply depot and crafting center for all recruits and let out a heavy breath, knowing that I was going to end up getting some lecture or other. I'd barely stepped foot inside the building when I sensed the air shift around me. This was the place all recruits entered during their first week at Four Point to collect supplies and any focus item they needed to have crafted to aid in their training. My hands fisted, making ready for the attack. I ducked just as a bolt of holy light grazed the top of my head. Blue and green swirls of magic swirled around my hands as I aimed them toward the darkest corners, searching out my attacker. I'm too old to fall for those tricks, I called out. And not sure why you're mad at me. It wasn't my idea to go out there. I saw a shape shifting in the shadows and lashed out with vines, ready to wrap up my attacker and pin her to the wall, 
but something hard whacked me over the head. I staggered forward with a curse, holding my head, as a second hit to my shoulder threw me into a stack of crates. Clearly you are not too old for anything, a stern voice said. The familiar thud of her staff hitting the concrete floor. Honestly Chaz, I thought you were beyond falling for my traps. Rubbing the back of my head, I turned around and stared at Agnes. Her face was set in a disgruntled frown of disapproval. Her silver hair was braided back fiercely, and she white-knuckle gripped her sleek black staff with its simple sapphire at the top. Her vest was blue, covering her black shirt and matching black pants and boots. This was her formal wear. Much more formal than what she had on this morning. Sister Agnes. I bowed my head in respect. She rolled her eyes. What? You disappoint me Chaz that's what, she muttered with a sigh. You haven't fallen for a simple trick like that in years. Hum? What's happened? Nothing happened, I argued, following her with a wince at the soreness in my back and head. Liar. You are a terrible liar. Always have been. She wandered through the stacks of crates and tables until she reached the rear of the building that was her workshop. In addition to where all the already crafted staves, wands, totems, and other essential weapons were stored and kept safe. Next to the locked cage wall, more tables were laden with materials and potion ingredients. More items than I cared to count, seeing as how growing up I'd spent the majority of my time here, in this very shop, working alongside Agnes. And what did I have to do when I messed up? Organize and clean every damned inch of this place. So what happened to you? She set her staff on hooks on the back wall, and picked up a nearby dagger and a polishing cloth. I shrugged nonchalantly. First day with the new recruits that you and Moran insisted I mingle with, I reminded her. You know I don't do well with people. And? I grunted, miming strangling her. Her bright golden glare pierced me with a stare. I dropped my hands. And Moran made me show everyone my shifting. Old bastard. Her eyes flared brighter as she sighed. Of course he did, she muttered, her focus returning to the dagger. He has his reasons, I suppose. That's it. I asked confused. You're not going to give him crap for it? No I'm not, and you shouldn't either. I leaned back against a nearby table watching her closely. This have anything to do with the missive he received this morning? The one you tried to break into his office to see. I shrugged. Have to do something to get answers when you two clam up. Though you may be his adopted son, in a sense, you do not have the security clearance to know everything, she said without looking up. You will just have to wait to see if he tells you or not. Does it have anything to do with why he's recruiting straight out of any year now? Including first years? Her hand paused in her polishing for a split second, but I caught it. Her jaw clenched, then she said, Also nothing you need to worry about, not now. You have more important issues to focus on. Such as finishing your own training. Perhaps this year you can take a recruit under your tutelage. No, I don't see the point. Though Moran seemed quite insistent on my speaking to two specific recruits, I added quietly. I feel he's pushing to see if we're compatible or not. Not sure why I should care about that now. She pursed her lips, set the dagger down, and chucked the polishing cloth across the shop. Of course you don't. Damn him. I told him this needed to wait. But no, he insists on pushing forward with this madness of his. What are you talking about? She paced from one end of the shop to the other, a habit Sister Agnes did not indulge in unless I managed to tick her off. Or when she was well and truly worried about something happening in the magical world. As close as I was to Moran, I usually knew more than most of the population did. Lately though, any time I asked Moran if there was anything major going on, he brushed off my questions. Had been doing that even before that missive arrived this morning. I meant to ask him where the fourth member of that elite team was. Where was their druid? I also knew that no new team had been formed in years, but I didn't know the reason for this. Or why Moran was ready to start recruiting younger and less experienced magic users. Sister Agnes, I said quietly. Her steps finally stilled. 
What isn't he telling me? And what madness do you speak of? She approached me and placed her hands on my shoulders, gripping them hard. It's nothing you need to concern yourself with, she said firmly. Understand? You have one more year before you are finished with your training. I will not have anything take you away from that. No matter what that damned man wants. I wanted to push the issue. Boy did I ever. But knew she wouldn't budge. She was by far the most stubborn person I'd ever met, even more so than Moran. You tell me though, right? If there was something I needed to worry about. I did ask, watching her closely. Yes always, she said quickly. Now tell me about these new recruits. What do you want to know? I asked, hopping up to sit on one of the tables as my thoughts drifted to one in particular. A woman with blue eyes that reminded me of a darkening night sky when she was annoyed. I inwardly cursed, knowing she was going to give me trouble. Rory Griffith. Even now, as I sat here, her name sounded like I should know it. Brogan seemed so certain, telling me that I had to know Rory from before. Before what? Anyway, I'd remember someone like her, or at least I thought I would. The longer I focused on those eyes, that smile. I frowned, feeling a weird fuzziness in my head. Why had Moran wanted me to be around them? He vaguely hinted that Brogan was a legacy, and that his parents or someone else in his family had been part of the elite teams, at one point or another. Not that I truly cared that much. I did care that Moran had some plan laid out that he was neglecting to share with me. Are you going to tell me or sit there daydreaming about this girl? Huh? Who said anything about a girl? I tried to make a blank face. And I was not daydreaming about her. I was wondering why Moran is so interested in her. The other one is a legacy. A shaman. But she's just a mage. Just a mage? Who is she? Agnes resumed the polishing of the dagger again, her gaze never leaving my face. She's a mage, I repeated with a shrug. That's all I know. Didn't care to ask more at the moment. Name? Rory Griffith. Agnes froze. What? I asked worried. She was silent. Agnes? She started polishing again but her jaw worked as if she was having a fight with herself over. I had no idea over what. Over Rory? Did she know her somehow? I would have remembered seeing Rory around. Agnes rarely left campus, which meant Rory would have had to come here. Interesting, she finally muttered tightly. And what do you think of her so far? Not sure, barely talked to her, I replied slowly, Wondering why she was acting like I hadn't just answered that question already. She's got an attitude about her, I know that much. I sense her power is strong, but she doesn't know it yet. Hum. All right, you're more secretive than usual, I muttered, annoyed. What's going on with you, huh? And Moran. You're hiding something. You both are. What is it? Are we under attack? Is there some enemy I don't know about making plans to come after us? Chaz Bryce, did you just raise your voice to me? I crossed my arms and nodded. Yeah. I did. Because you've been acting strange for the last few weeks. You can tell me all you want that it's not my problem, but I'm a magic user, a pretty damn strong one, and if there's an issue, if you're in danger, or Moran is, I can help protect you both. After all that you've done for me. No, she snapped. No, you are not to get involved. Do you understand me? I was trained by you and Moran, I reminded her as I slid off the table. I can do this. I'm ready if I need to be. Just tell me the truth. What was in the missive? But she was shaking her head again, and her eyes glowed bright yellow as she lost what was usually a firm grip on her emotions. I will not have you putting yourself in harm's way. I said I would keep you safe, Chaz, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. You are not to run off headfirst into danger. So there is a reason to worry, I said. She cursed. Just tell me. No. And don't you dare ask Moran either. I forbid it. I backed away from her, my anger growing. 
You are not in charge of me. Her eyes darkened, and she reached for me, but I backed away again. Chaz, please, you don't know what you're asking of me. I can't watch you, I won't. She gave up on trying to find the words, but she didn't have to say them for me to know what she spoke of. They died in a car accident, I whispered. It had nothing to do with who they were. She let out a shaky breath, and for the first time in my life, Agnes looked afraid. She hung her head, her silver braid falling over her shoulder. I suppose at some point or other, it would be wise to tell you the truth. Moran urged me to do it years ago, but I clung to hope that you would take a different path than your parents. I was wrong, and it appears Moran is going to shove you into this life, whether you want it or not. Want what? I demanded. The exhilaration from using my power all evening long slipped away, as a heavy dread weighed in my gut. A vice squeezed my chest the longer I looked into Agnes's eyes, a woman I trusted since I'd come into her care. A woman I considered a second mother, after losing my own. Agnes? I muttered roughly. What truth? Tell me, damn it. What did you and Moran lie to me about all these years? What? Green and blue sparks flitted around my fingertips as my anger, and the horrible sensation of betrayal struck me like a punch to the gut. Your parents, Agnes started then stopped, rubbing a hand down her face. Your parents did not die in a car accident. No. I was there. I was in the car with them, I uttered. Wasn't I? You were with them, but you were supposed to be at a safe house. You and your parents. The enemy found them, they attacked, and their leaders got away, she explained quietly, voice racked with guilt. I'm so sorry Chaz. I, we failed your parents. Failed you that night, and I thought hoped that by taking you in it would ease my pain, but all it did was make it worse. Your pain, I snapped. Your pain? What about my pain? I shouted. You lied to me all these years, all of you did. Who killed them? And a safe house? What the hell happened, huh? What? Tell me, or I'll go track down Moran and make him tell me. The story is not one that can be told in a night, she confessed. Chaz, wait. Why should I? I yelled and continued for the door. Fury flooded my veins, and the call of the forest was too strong to resist. My walk turned into a frantic run as I took off across the dark grounds and aimed for the trees. Power flowed through my veins, and the mark on my hand pulsed a bright blue and green hue that swarmed around the rest of me, until I became lost in a swirling vortex of color. The nature of the beast burst from my chest with a fierce roar, and I landed on all four paws, tearing through underbrush and mowing down small trees that blocked my path. I shook out my head, my hot breath steaming in the chilly night air. I ran and ran until my skin tingled with the magical barricade that protected the campus from intruders. My paws slipped on wet leaves and grass as I stopped before I rammed headfirst into it. I changed direction and took off again, trotting as fast as I could. Once before, my life had been turned upside down. I thought I'd overcome it. Learned to live without my parents. Became who I was because of the two people who took me in that night. But they lied to me. They lied about everything. Once again, my world was spinning out of my control. The only two people I came to trust and rely on had betrayed me. It didn't matter how strong I was now, or how impressive my druidic magic had become. My parents had been hunted down. And for what? Why? Was that why I was kept here then? Because whoever killed them was still after me. I climbed up along the mountainside that created the backdrop for the outpost, and when I found myself at the top, I glared at the crescent moon and the stars dotting the sky. Never before had I felt the need to have revenge, but now the very idea of hunting down and finding whoever killed my parents ignited a new, insane passion within me. Agnes said their leaders. Plural. No matter. I swore an oath on my very druidic powers that I would find these villains, hunt them down, and kill them without mercy. Elite guard or not, I would find out the truth, and I would destroy their lives. Moran and Agnes would try to stop me but if they could have their secrets, so could I. I roared my anger into the night, and I was encased in a golden glow that fell over me like ropes, binding my words in magic and making them unbreakable. 
Then they were gone, and I was left struggling to breathe from the weight of what I'd just done. I shut my eyes, the night wind ruffling the fur of my bare body as I sank to the rocky ground. My oath would have to be fulfilled one way or another or I had just cursed myself forever. Chapter 7 Chaz My head throbbed as I stumbled out of my dorm room and into the hall. I growled under my breath at the hustle and bustle of the other recruits around me, baring my teeth at anyone who tried to talk to me. Food. I needed food and about a gallon of coffee. I had stayed in bear form far too long and used too much magic. The after effect was as bad as a hangover, worse actually. I slept for maybe three hours. Today was going to be a shit day, but it was too late to turn back the clock now. The oath I'd made was fresh in my mind, and I worried who would find out what I'd done. I planned on avoiding Agnes as much as possible, but Moran, if I saw him, he'd be lucky if all I did was deck him, instead of shifting into bear form and tossing him around the lawn. I somehow made my way into the hall, and snagged coffee, and filled my plate up with every meat available to get my strength back. I had just started digging in, when someone sat down across from me. A bit hungry this morning Sparky, Rory said smartly. I lifted my head, and a growl rumbled in my chest before I could even try to hold it back. Her brow arched but it did nothing to scare her away. You really do look like shit. You alright? She was worried about me. Why? I just met her the day before, and I knew how much of a jerk I'd come across as. I remembered what Brogan told me, and really looked at her, taking in every detail of her face, down to those blue eyes that filled with genuine concern for my well-being. Chaz. Rough night is all, I finally muttered swallowing my mouthful of food and taking a few swigs of coffee to wash it down. Why are you sitting with me? There was an open seat, and I didn't see Brogan around yet. Sorry for trying to be civil. Don't worry, I'll let you eat in peace and wallow in whatever self-pity crap you try to hide from everyone else, she snapped and grabbed her coffee, making to stand. Wait. I reached for her arm. Just hold on, I'm sorry alright? Not a morning person, she asked, glancing down at my hand on her arm. Something like that, yeah, I replied, not sure why I grew anxious when she started to go away. Please, you can stay here and drink your coffee if you want. I'll try not to be such an ass. You sure you can handle that? Seems a bit rough for you, after the last couple days. But she took back her seat. Besides, someone suggested I get to know you. My hand fell away and I picked at my breakfast, not feeling as hungry as I had before. Who? She tugged on one of her braids as she mumbled, Commander Moran, actually. Never expected to meet him face to face, but he was standing outside the hall. Said you could use some company, and that getting to know you would be helpful to me. Not sure how though. Me neither, I replied quietly. Moran was pushing her toward me, and with her sitting here, Brogan would be sure to join us. What was it with these two? I clutched at my stomach for a second, wondering if eating had even been a good idea, but the wave of nausea passed. I was taking another long drink of my coffee when I looked at her over my cup, remembering the words she'd just thrown at me. Self-pity. What about it? You said I was wallowing in self-pity. Why did you say that? She shrugged, fiddling with one of her braids. You look upset and that whole arrogant air you have going on? Seen it before. Something's eating at you. What are you, a mind reader? I asked, doing my best not to sound annoyed. And from the scowl she shot me, I hadn't tried hard enough. No, but I've seen it before. The look. You know. The woe is me, my life sucks, so I'm going to try and be the biggest badass around, so no one messes with me and sees it look. She picked up her coffee, slowly stirring it. Then she set it back down, not seeming to want it anymore. Just saying, you might want to try another tactic. You don't seem very popular around here, and since we're all supposed to be this one big friendly helpful family. She shrugged. Just a suggestion. I'll keep that in mind, I replied, debating if I should ask her if there was any reason we would recognize each other or know one another, but I couldn't get the question out. 
we sat in silence for a few minutes. I was busy digging through every memory I had, and searching for any sign of Rory in my remembrances. Nothing popped up, and I sat back with a grunt. Bad news from home or something? Is that why you're a cranky-ass bear? I crossed my arms on the table and stared at her. What? You keep growling. You like to talk a lot. Don't you? Happens. Plus, I'm trying not to panic about my first day here. So yeah. Do a girl a favor and talk about something? Anything? I glanced around the hall. Where's your new boyfriend? Brogan? Not my boyfriend, she said quickly. Just met the guy, but if he was here don't worry, I'd be more than happy to bug him instead of you. Why are you panicking? Nope. I asked you a question first, she argued. Answer mine and I'll answer yours. We're not kids. She tapped her fingers on the table, resting her chin in the palm of her other hand, and simply waited. I grunted, picking at my food again, but those damn blue eyes kept on staring at me until I gave up with a growl and met her gaze. For a split second, a flash of a memory hit me, and I paused, sensing she felt it too, but then the moment was gone, and I decided talking to someone who did not know me might not be such a bad idea, after all. That? and my curiosity was starting to get the best of me. If Moran wanted me to get to know her, then I would. Nah, I finally answered. No home. Aside from this place. No family. Rory leaned back in her chair. What do you mean? Mean my parents died when I was five. Car wreck, I said, repeating the lie I'd been told for so damn long. Shit. Sorry Chaz. Her hand rested on mine for a second before she drew it back. But wait, you said this has been your home, since you were five? How is that possible? When my parents died, I was taken in by a close family friend of theirs, I said, watching my tone. The last thing I wanted was to lose control of my anger and take it out on someone who was just trying to be nice to me. Sister Agnes. And Moran. I mentally nodded at myself for not snarling as I spoke their names. Rory was nodding, but then she stopped. Commander Moran. The one and only. You were raised by him. And Sister Agnes, I added. She's a priest here. More like a legend, really. You'll meet her soon enough. She's the one in control of all the weapon crafting, supplies, stuff. Essentially anything a recruit needs, she's the one who gets a hold of it. Rory looked at me as if I must have had the best childhood. Is that why he wanted me to get to know you? And no wonder you're so good at what you do. You've been here what, 17 years? Yeah. And Moran and Agnes were the ones who trained me until I turned 21, I said, avoiding her first question. That was a mess I was not ready to step into yet. Damn. I mean it's a shitty situation, but I'll admit I'm a bit jealous. I had no instruction whatsoever growing up. Been floundering. But still. Damn. To lose your parents. Yeah, I wouldn't trade my mom for that. Or anything. She was tugging on her braid again, and another flash of memory hit me hard, then it faded away. Of her doing just that and someone scolding her playfully for it, who was it? You know what? I can't even find a damned familiar. Think they all know I'm messed up, she said with a bitter laugh. That's not how familiars work, I assured her. You just have to be patient, wait for the right one to come to you. Not very patient. Noticed, I agreed. She shot me a look, then grinned. It helped ease some of my anger, slightly. Both your parents can't do magic? You said you had no instruction. Mom's side had some, back a few generations. And Dad, as far as we know, he never showed any signs of having abilities before he left us. She said it casually, like it didn't bother her, but I saw the sadness flicker in her eyes. Then she smiled, and it was gone. Nice to know I wasn't the only one around here hiding my true emotions today. Made me wonder why she'd called me out about trying to hide my loneliness and pain from the deaths of my parents. No not deaths. Murders. They were murdered. My hands curled into fists on the table. 
I took a deep breath, in through my nose and pushed it out, unclenching my hands and trying to get back to a calm, relaxed state. Wasn't working. Rory's glance flicked to my hands. I know I'm not an expert here, but pretty sure keeping anger bottled up is terrible for your abilities. I know it is for mine. Is that why you're panicking? I asked, changing the subject before I ended up telling her everything. No one needed to know what Agnes had told me. And that would open up a whole other line of questioning about my parents. I could tell she didn't want to answer, but then I reminded her of the deal we made. Fine, it's just. I'm the first mage in my family for generations, and I can't seem to get anything right. And the announcement Moran made last night has me on edge. Not sure why. About him taking recruits early. You don't have to worry about that. That was a lie. For all I knew, she did need to worry about it. You say that but my gut is screaming that's not the case. Why would she feel that way? From what she said, none of her family had dealings with the Vanguard or Moran. He had to know something I didn't, if he wanted to see her magic was compatible with mine. I already sensed he was going to ask me, especially after the way Agnes yelled about it last night. If Moran asked, I would join, but I knew Agnes would be upset with me. She'd been so afraid, and it only made me more curious to learn who had gone after my parents and violently ripped them from this world. Ever since she told me the truth, I kept thinking back to the night of the car wreck. I could still hear the screams of my parents, glass breaking, the crunch of metal, but each time one tiny detail changed. There were others yelling in blood, so much blood. Chaz. I blinked, clearing the grisly thoughts away to find Rory's hand holding mine. Sorry, zoned out for a minute. You know this is going to sound really weird, and you can just ignore it if you want to, she said quietly, but if you need to talk about something, I wouldn't mind listening. I'm here, I guess is what I'm getting at, just wanted you to know. I covered her hand with mine and a burst of warmth shot between us. I appreciate it, and I'll keep it in mind. I don't exactly have many close friends here, none really. Could have fooled me, she said with a small grin. Yeah, I'm good at that apparently, I mumbled, pulling my hand back. Fooling others and being fooled. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Don't worry about it. I have to get going, but I'll see you around. I said, not sure why I was drawn to her or why I was doing what Moran wanted me to. Sure I'll be here, she joked. Hey Chaz? Can I ask you one more thing? I nodded and waited to stand. I saw three of one elite team walking around last night, do you know what happened to their fourth? Moran seemed pretty pissed about something when he was talking to them. When did you see them? Last night, before the power display started. Moran might have raised me, but I don't have security clearance to know everything, I said, but smiled as I did. I'm sure there's nothing we need to be concerned about, I told her I'd see her at dinner, took my dishes to the stack, and stalked out of the hall. I was expected to report to my first training session of the morning, but first, I needed to speak with Moran. I wanted to see his reaction when he realized I knew the truth about my parents, and I also wanted to know what he was trying to keep from me. I hurried out of the admin building and took the path that would lead me to the official outpost attached to campus. At the metal gate, I was stopped and my ID checked, even though the guards knew who I was. Protocol was protocol. You know where Commander Moran is? I asked. Not sure. I think in his office, the guard told me. You want me to call for him? No. I'll go find him. I marched on, my anger building with every step I took toward his office. I nodded to every guard and commander on the way, until I stood outside Moran's door. Usually, I would knock and wait for him to allow me to enter, but I wasn't feeling very respectful this morning. I pushed open the door and walked in, ready to let him have it. I stopped short. A growl slipped out of my mouth, and I felt ready to be overtaken by my bare form again, as my anger exploded. Chaz, Agnes said, standing before Moran's desk, closed the door. I ground my teeth, glaring from her to Moran. His hands were folded on his desk as he watched me closely. 
I pivoted and made to leave, but he snapped my name, and after so many years of training under him, my body reacted on instinct. My spine straightened, and I squared my shoulders, standing at attention as I awaited his next order. Shut the door, Chaz. Agnes tells me we need to talk. My hands twitched at my sides, but I finally reached out and shut the door, the click reverberating around his office. You could start by explaining to me why you lied. My words came out in a garbled growl. You will not shift in my office, Chaz, Moran warned. Hear me. Yeah, I hear you. Now answer my damned question. I whipped around to glare at him. The man didn't even flinch. Never did. I waited for the fear to appear in his eyes as I'd seen in Agnes's, but they remained steady, holding my gaze, as though I didn't look like I wanted to tear him to pieces. Your parents were part of an elite guard team, he started. I knew that much. As such, he went on, as if I hadn't spoken, they made enemies. Violent ones that hold grudges. Hold? Present tense? So they did get away that night. I noticed Agnes's head drop, but kept my gaze locked with Moran's. Who were they? What happened? Just tell me the truth for once, please. You have to swear you will not try to leave campus, Moran said. Otherwise, no. You have no right to ask that. Yes, I do, he replied calmly. I promise to keep you safe just as Agnes did, and that oath does not depend on your age. You will remain here where we can keep an eye on you. Swear it, Chaz, or you're walking out of here with nothing. Furious, I paced back and forth across his office. Agnes reached out a hand to me, but I shrugged away from her, hating the second I saw the hurt in her eyes followed by guilt. Please, she urged, we're just trying to keep you safe. Keep you alive. You have to understand, these people they're not, they're monsters. If they figure out you're alive, if you go after them, you won't survive. You've seen what I can do, I said. And we've seen what they can do, Moran said simply. As good as you are, you will get yourself killed if you go after them. I hunched in on myself, planting my hands on my hips. I would have to lie, and lie well, I'd already sworn to get revenge, and one way or another, I'd get it. Fine. I won't go after them. Now tell me the truth. What happened to my parents? Moran took a deep breath and let it out, the only sign he hated what he was about to do. The team your parents were part of was tracking down a new threat, he started. Magic users were turning up crazed and corrupted. Out of their minds. They were becoming a danger to themselves and others, including innocents. Their task was to understand why this was happening. Only here. I asked. No. All across the world. At first it was only a few, but then it was as if a plague of corruption was moving through the magical communities. I rubbed my forehead, and that ache that sprang to life. How are there no reports on this? We kept it quiet to avoid mass panic. If non-users learned the magical community was under attack, and there was a chance they would be caught in the fallout, what do you think would have happened? We hunkered down, sought out those afflicted, and took them away silently. Took them away to where? Moran looked to Agnes as she said, Asylums for our kind. Where they could be looked after. And they lived. They both lowered their gazes, and that was answer enough. And my parents, they found out who was behind the attacks? I asked, feeling as if something was constricting my throat as I came closer to the truth. They did. The four of them, Moran said, nodding his head as he stood up and paced to the window. He clasped his hands behind his back, staring outside for a long while. Silence filled the office. Just when I was about to growl at him to keep talking, he hung his head. I sent them to the location they thought these villains were hiding out. Our recon team asserted there was only four of them in there, at most. They were wrong so terribly wrong. Two of the team were taken captive, and your parents barely made it out alive. I glanced at Agnes but she refused to meet my gaze. And? And they knew who your parents were. They came after them on several occasions, so we set them up in a safe house. Moran faced me and looked his age at that moment more than any other. I failed your parents that night. We all did. 
We got a tip the enemy was moving, and we went after them, blinded by hatred and the need for revenge. We pulled most of the protection from the house, but it had all been a trap. They knew where your parents were. By the time we got there, he swallowed hard and seemed to have to force the words from his mouth. Your parents were beyond saving. We chased off the enemy. We found you in a hidden safe room. I staggered back a step, shutting my eyes as I heard the screams all over again. This time, I focused on those small details and heard mom yell for dad, heard glass shatter and the ground shaking. I remembered an unfamiliar voice yelling in anger, and a flash of mom's face before she disappeared. It no longer sounded like a car wreck. Now it was more like a storm that had torn through the house, cracked the foundation, and collapsed walls. I sank deeper and deeper into the memory, until I felt like I was falling. Hands grabbed my shoulders and gave me a firm shake. My eyes shot open, and I looked into Agnes's glowing irises. Don't, she whispered fiercely, don't go back to that night. There's only pain. I blinked hard a few times, chasing the last screams away. Who attacked them? I asked, my voice hoarse as if I'd been yelling. Who are they? Agnes glanced over her shoulder to Moran. Tell him. Tell him everything and be done with it. Moran appeared ready to argue. Agnes yelled his name. They call themselves the Cleansers. All we know is they're led by a man and a woman. Two of the most ruthless people I've ever heard of, he uttered, his voice shaking with such raw emotion. Their followers believe they are the new coming, and they will wash away the evils of this world. Evils being what, magic users? So they're just another hate group. No no they're more than that, Moran argued. Terrorist group would be a better description. I don't know how they're doing it, none of us do, but they are the reason our people are being corrupted, driven to madness, why we're finding some stripped of their magic. Wait. What? I asked alarmed. Stripped? How do they have that if they can't perform magic? We don't know. For the last 17 years, we have been hunting for them, but they never leave a trace. He shifted on his feet. They're also the reason we have not been able to form a team every three years. How? Why? To be in a team, the four must be compatible, Moran said. In the last five cycles, we have only found three teams total that were able to work together. Our elite guard force is dwindling. Which is why you're looking to recruit anyone you can, I said quietly. And the current team here? Where's Graham the Druid? Infirmary. Under quarantine, Moran said, shaking his head. He's been corrupted. By these cleansers? I didn't understand how this could be possible. There was no way to strip magic from someone unless you used magic. But these people they were doing it, causing harm, it wasn't possible. I want to help. No, Agnes and Moran said at the same time. No, Agnes repeated. You are to stay here where you will be safe. I can help, I insisted. They need a druid. You are not compatible with them, Moran sighed. Or as much as Agnes might kill me for it, I would have already had you with them. However, if we do find that you are compatible with any of these new recruits coming in, then that might just change. That's it. You just expect me to walk around and act like I don't know anything about this crisis. Yes. If you don't then I will drag your ass here to the outpost, and you will be training under Farah, and only Farah, he warned speaking of the druid commander here. And you are to say nothing to the other recruits. The last thing we need is a panic. Shouldn't the communities know, so they can keep an eye out? We're taking care of it, he promised, but I could see the worry on his face that whatever safety measures they were taking weren't enough. That's where most of the vanguard and other elite teams have been stationed these last few months. We can speak of this more if you wish later. You are late for your training. One more question and then I'll go. I wondered why I was even bothering to ask. Is there something I need to know about Rory Griffith and Brogan Bailey? Why you set them on me? Moran's jaw clenched hard. Nothing particular. Just a hunch that you may be compatible with them. I suggest you take the time to see for yourself. And if I don't wish to try with them. 
then you will make me order you to do so. It's your choice. I shrugged, not ready to start another argument with him. I wanted to ask more, so much more, but my head was a mess, full of rambling thoughts with the realization of how much I had not been told over the years. How many of our kind were ruined because of those bastards? How many were killed? I nodded solemnly to them both, then excused myself. I stepped out into the hall, but glanced back through the crack just in time to catch Moran pulling Agnes into his arms. He kissed the top of her head, and they whispered quietly to each other. Technically speaking, they were not allowed to be together, but most of us here knew about it. We just learned to keep our mouths shut. To see them comforting each other, almost openly, that sent up red flags. We were in even more danger than he'd admitted. And then there was their reaction to Rory's last name, they both knew it. I went into that office wanting answers, and I got them. But those answers were so much more than I was ready to handle. Was Rory involved in this mess? Was her family? What if she was in danger, just like I was? As far as I knew, she had no one watching out for her. That would have to change. I might not be able to go after these bastards yet, but I'd keep an eye out for Rory. At least, until I learned who she was to me. And why the hell, I felt like I should remember her. Chapter 8 Vori I woke up early and made it to the hall before most of the other recruits, snagged coffee, usually the only thing I worried about getting in the morning, and sat at the same table I'd found Chaz at the day before. I wasn't sure if I hoped to see him again or not, but I did keep an eye out for Brogan. My first day had been filled with mostly instruction, and a breakdown of how the next three years were going to go. It had been a lot to take in, and I'd been stressing out by dinner. But Brogan managed to get me to smile and relax again. He had that way about him, and I found myself drawn to him. Chaz, on the other hand, was a mystery I couldn't figure out. That, and why Moran wanted me to get to know him. Morning. Brogan grinned, joining me a few minutes later. You ready for today? The first day of using our abilities with our trainers. I sighed, shaking my head with a nervous laugh. God, it's going to suck. You can't go into it with that outlook because then it will. Easy for you to say. I stirred my coffee, watching it swirl around. Commander Blade was the mage I would be training under. Along with the other new recruits. Today was all about finding out which element spoke to me the loudest, so I could begin to narrow my focus. Once I had that figured out, I'd be sent to have my staff crafted. I'd seen a few other mages walking around with theirs, and each one was unique and beautiful. Chaz had said Sister Agnes was in charge of all the weapons here. I was excited, and a bit intimidated to come face to face with such a legend, but there was really no choice. I would need a staff at some point or another, and today it looked like was going to be that day. Stay positive and trust yourself. Brogan reached over to rest his hand on mine. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but remember what Chaz told you. Magical strength comes from within, from believing in yourself. I glanced around the hall one more time, looking for Chaz, but he wasn't here yet. You're right, I'm ridiculous. What about you? How do you feel about today? Actually pretty good, he mused. Had a dream I was back in that field. And? And let's just say, though I might not be back at my full potential yet, Mother Nature has not abandoned me as I worried she had. His lips twitched in a small grin, and he seemed more than ready to begin his next phase of training. I drank the rest of my coffee, and when breakfast ended Brogan and I left the hall together, though we parted ways once outside. He had to join the other shamans, and I was to go with the mages across the lawn near the greenhouses. We'd met inside yesterday in one of the many lecture halls, but for everyone's safety and the very old building, Commander Blade said we would be training outside unless the weather wasn't suitable. Though he hinted, that would hardly ever be the case. Thankfully, I was from Oregon and used to cold weather. I hurried across the lawn, falling in with the mages I'd briefly met the day before. There were only three new recruits, including me. The rest were second and third years. They were talking quietly, and I caught Moran's name a few times. 
I glanced around and spotted the reason for bringing his name up. I tripped over my feet, nearly face planting in the grass. You okay? One of the other mages asked. Yeah, sorry. But why is Moran here? I whispered to her. She shrugged, her face paling slightly. No idea but does make this morning a bit worse. Just a bit, I agreed. He was speaking with Commander Blade, and when they saw us approaching, the latter separated and waited for his class to gather, hands clasped behind his back, chin held high. Commander Blade was young, maybe late twenties with a stern face. His eyes were fiery orange with a hue of gold. Instead of appearing angry, they were filled with life and kindness, patience, qualities something I sorely lacked. I was trying not to be like a few of the other mages, who kept looking at him like he was the most handsome guy on the planet, but he was quite attractive. Seeing as he was my commander, I was not going to imagine anything further with that man. His gaze flickered to me, and he bowed his head subtly, then he called us all to attention. The mage beside me shot me a curious look, but I shrugged. I had no idea why he would do that. None at all. But it made me wonder about the first day, and those people who registered me. How they acted after they heard my name. What was going on here that I didn't understand? Good morning recruits, Blade called loudly. As you can see, we are joined by Commander Moran. He is going to be observing all training classes over the next few days, so don't feel too special just yet. He winked, and the older recruits grinned and laughed. I did not. I looked at the older man. He had no hint of amusement anywhere on his face. Why did he have to be here, on our first official training day? Now then second years pair off and third years pair off. Run through the basics and move your way up for today. No trying anything new, he added with a firm glare. First years come forward please. Front and center. I wasn't the only one who grimaced as we stepped forward to face Commander Blade. I wondered briefly if that was really his name. I stood in the center and expected him to approach either the guy on my left or the other girl, but instead, he walked up to me and stopped. I stood as tall as I could, not sure if I should meet his gaze and found myself doing it anyway. He turned his head slightly as if studying me, then he gave another slight nod. It's nice to see someone not afraid to make eye contact, he said conversationally. Very good start. Sir? I asked, not sure where this was going. Now then, Rory Griffith, you were to spend yesterday determining which path you will follow. Did you do so? I tried but honestly, I'm still not certain, I said with a cringe. Very well then, he said and backed away. If you would please stand over here. My heart sank. Was I in trouble already? The one mage, who didn't know how to use her abilities, didn't know what she wanted to do. I tried not to sulk as I walked to where he motioned and waited, feeling Moran watching me closely the entire time. It set me on edge, and I wanted to ask him if he could glare at something else. I bit my tongue, not ready to get myself into any more trouble with the most powerful man in this region. I waited for Blade to begin speaking with one of the other first years, but instead he whirled around, his hand-carved dark wood staff appearing in his hand. The tip glowed brightly with bright orange flames, and then he turned, and a fireball flew at my face. I ducked with a yelp, hitting the ground as it shot over my head. Defend yourself, he ordered. Just as I got to my feet, he attacked again. I don't know how. I dodged the second blast. I've never been in a fight before. And that's going to change, right now. Act, Griffith, or you will get yourself killed. Fight back. He picked up the pace of his attack. I waited for something to happen. Anything. But it was like time slowed down and the marking on the back of my hand glowed brightly for a few seconds, then it went out completely, leaving nothing but a dark tattoo on my skin. It wasn't Blade's reaction that suddenly pissed me off and made me annoyed. No, he just kept attacking, telling me over and over again to let instinct take over. It was Moran's look of utter disappointment, his lip lifted as if in disgust, then he turned and started walking away. Somewhere inside me, a burst of anger I never experienced before, and I yelled a battle cry in fury as the next attack came flying at me, 
ready to take me down. It wasn't fire that filled my veins. It was a shivering cold breath that flowed through me, from my toes to my head down to my fingertips. A white and blue burst of frost shot from my hands, and the fireball was deflected, exploding in the ground to my right. But I didn't stop there. I summoned that power again, and unleashed it on Blade, making him go on the defensive as I formed the frost into bolts and shot them at him one after the other. He spun around on the ball of his foot, and a burst of fire struck my center. It would have burned me if I hadn't managed to produce a small shield of ice to stop it. He prepared to do it again, and this time I formed a larger shield and held it fast even as he blasted it with fire. I ground my teeth, a fierce cry erupting from my very core as I pushed back as hard as I could. When Blade finally let up the attack, my ice wall still stood, but I sank to my knees breathing ragged, my entire body shaking. I glanced at my hand, stunned to see the tattoo shifting around as it formed a jagged mountain of ice formed in a circle of snowflakes. It gave one more blue pulse of power, then it settled. Well done, Blade announced as the last of the ice wall around me shattered. He clapped his hands along with the rest of the mages. You are a very strong frost mage, Griffith, very strong. Just needed to tap into that inner strength of yours. I nodded, unable to get words to form as weakness overtook me. I was on my ass now, sitting in the grass. The other recruits came over to pat me on the shoulder, excitedly talking about what I'd done. Between them, I spotted Moran watching me once again. Blade went over and spoke quietly to him for a moment. Then the commander tipped his head in my direction, and walked away. I was going to take that as a sign of approval, and my stomach sank even more than earlier when I thought I was in trouble. The last thing I wanted, was Moran thinking I would be good for his elite guard. I inwardly cursed myself for not faltering more against Blade's attack, but it was like someone else took me over and the power rush was insatiable. Give her some air, Blade said as the recruits returned to their practice and the first years stepped to the side. He crouched down before me, his staff gone, and pressed his palm to my forehead. You are quite chilled. How do you feel? Like shit, I muttered without thinking then cringed. Blade smiled. Happens the first time you really tap into your power. The shaking will take a while to wear off too. Take a rest over there, catch your breath and do not try to use your magic again just yet. I wasn't even considering it. I managed to get to my feet, but everything spun around me, and I was about to fall back down when Blade caught my arm in a firm grip. I'm all right, just dizzy. I blinked a few times, but that did nothing to help. Lean on me, I got you, he said, and together we made it to a bench beneath a willow tree. Close your eyes. Breathe deeply. You'll be fine. I grunted in reply, and he laughed then he returned to the other first years. I stayed on the bench, then after a while I decided to lay down. I looked up into the willow branches. I marveled at what happened. I'd used frost like it was second nature. I'd only managed to call up ice once before, ever. And it was barely worth mentioning. Nothing tea like what I just did. Blade's instructions for the rest of the lesson sounded so far away as my mind drifted. I held my hand up, smiling at the mark. No longer composed of all the elements, now it matched the power that exploded out of me a short while ago. A frost mage. I was going to be a frost mage. I couldn't wait to text mom that news later. I glanced past my hands to the swaying branches overhead. Should I tell her the other news too, about Moran seeming pleased with what I could do? There had to be a reason he was so interested in me, and not stuck around to watch the others. And why he'd wanted me to get to know Chaz. I doubted it was so his adopted son, or whatever he called him, could make a friend. This time when my gut churned, it wasn't from use of so much power, but from the notion that I'd gotten Moran's attention, and that was the last thing I'd wanted when I arrived here. Good job Rory, you went and messed up already, I mumbled to myself flinging my arm over my eyes. Griffith? You alive or do I need to call for a priest? Huh? I moved my arm. Blade looked down at me, arms crossed, brow arched in amusement. No, I'm good I think. Class is over you know. It is. 
I sat up too fast to look and fell back down with a groan. I swear, I was listening to what was going on. Where'd everyone else go? Dismiss first years to go find Sister Agnes and get their staves made. The others went to lunch. I covered my mouth at the mention of food, my other hand shooting to my stomach. Hum, think I'll skip eating today. Not a good idea, trust me. Easy for you to say, you're used to this shit. He laughed and helped me sit up. Slowly this time, then sat down next to me. I had the same experience when I was a first year. Why do I not believe you? He shrugged. It's true. But now you're a trainer and a commander. All it takes is one good push to see what you're capable of. Like launching fireballs at my head. He didn't even try to hide his grin. I take it someone did that for you. They had to a few times actually, he admitted. You'll get there. Not sure I want to, if I'm going to feel like this every time. It won't, but your body has to build up a tolerance for it and that takes practice, he explained. Ah, got it. So what you're saying is I'll feel like this for a few months and then I'll be peachy. That's great news really, I rambled on. He laughed. I shot him a look. Why is Moran so interested in me? I asked quietly. Blade looked out across the lawn. He's interested in all recruits. That's bullshit and we both know it. Did you just mouth off to your commander? He turned serious. I hung my head about to apologize. He gave a sharp laugh. When we're not in training, I do encourage my trainees to speak freely. Too stressful all the time otherwise. He sighed heavily, caught a leaf in his hands as it fell from the tree. And that is something I honestly can't answer for you. But you know. He held up his palm with the leaf in it. His eyes flared bright blue, and the leaf on his hand froze into a beautiful piece of art. I thought you were a fire mage. I am but I still tap into my frost abilities, now and again. Some of us are able to handle two paths, but that is not a reason to try and push yourself, he added quickly, handing me the leaf. I held it gently in my hand. You'll learn many things here, Griffith, some you may not like, but you can't let that stop you from fulfilling your destiny. Cryptic much? He stood and began walking away. That was not helpful. He kept on walking, and I settled back on the bench for a while longer, holding the leaf in my hands, taking in the intricate detail of the ice over the veins of the leaf. Eventually, I had to get my butt over to the supply depot, I knew this. I finally said screw it and found my feet. I might as well get it over with, though I wasn't sure what I had to be so nervous about now. I figured out my path, finding out what staff would work best for me should be easy, right? The walk across the lawn to the supply depot was way too short, and I found myself standing outside the doors. My hand hovered over the handle, but for some reason I couldn't get myself to move forward. There was no reason why I shouldn't want to go in there, but my gut told me that the moment I had a staff in hand, Moran's attention to my abilities was only going to increase. There was no avoiding it, and my hand moved as if on its own. Then I was inside the massive building, looking around at the stacks of crates lining the walls, tables filled with materials odds and ends. I wasn't sure where to go, and there was no convenient sign that read, get your staff here, so I slowly wandered around. I hadn't thought much time passed since Blade sent the other recruits, but I guess I dozed longer than I realized. Hello? I called out. No one replied. I ran my hands gently along the tables, until I reached the far back wall where numerous crafted weapons already hung. Staves, daggers, totems, swords, so many it was hard to take them all in. They were locked behind a wire cage, so all I could do was admire the craftsmanship. Had Agnes made all of these? That had to take years, decades. How old was this priest? A metallic click had come from the right. One of the cage doors swung outward all on its own. Ah, hello. I tried again, not even sure why I was walking toward the cage door. But there was some force drawing me to it, and when I reached it, I studied the wall behind it. There were several staves forming a line on the wall. They were magnificent, each one unique, 
but it was the one on the far left that drew my gaze like a magnet. It was ebony, made of metal, not wood. But it was the topper that made me speechless. The metal curved and twisted like the branches of a tree, each piece detailed like bark. At the very center was a sapphire, very light in color, and shaped like the knot at the center of a tree trunk. I'd never seen a gemstone shaped like that. I took the staff in my hands. It was cool to the touch, heavy, but not uncomfortable to hold. I shifted it from one hand to the other, feeling the iciness of my power flooding my veins again. The sapphire winked at me just once. When I stared at it intensely, it didn't happen again. I gripped the staff, and a strange sense of rightness struck me hard in the chest. When I let out a breath, it was frost-tinged. More frost formed at my fingertips, climbing up my hands and arms in crystallized patterns. They had a darker tinge to them, almost like a shadow moved under each one, around it, through it. My left hand tingled along the back side, and I watched it not sure what to expect. What are you doing? I spun around, clutching the staff in my hands. A silver-haired woman stared me down. I, I, uh, I'm sorry, the cage door just opened and I shouldn't have touched it. I'll put it back. Sorry, I mumbled. The woman I assumed was Sister Agnes nodded once firmly. Her gaze dipped to the staff I held and her expression softened. Her lips parted and her brow furrowed. I wasn't sure what she was going to say. She cleared her throat and said, that staff is for a necromancer anyway. It would not do well for you. Necromancer? I spun the staff slowly between my hands. I thought they were all gone. They are for now, at least. She nodded to the wall. Put it back carefully, if you please, and then we will get to work finding you your own staff. I returned the ebony staff to the wall, sad to see it locked away, and stepped out of the cage. She locked it quickly, then guided me over to a table close by. Now then let's start. Let me look at you. She held my chin in her fingers, and her eyes flared yellow as she studied what felt like more than just my face. I fidgeted, not sure I liked this much attention from her. She made noises and talked to herself, saying words that I couldn't understand. Right then hold this. She held out a cherrywood staff. I took it but it felt off. Hum don't think this one. She nodded as if to say she expected it that, then moved down the line of other woods. Each time the staves felt off, and I longed to have a staff like the metallic one back in my grip. As if sensing the same, Agnes handed me a dark metal staff next, no topper. She waited. The moment it was in my hands. I sucked in a breath and tested the balance, the feel of it. Go on, give it a few swings, make a few moves, she urged. Not sure I know any. Then do what comes naturally. I wasn't sure what that was either. I stepped away from the table and closed my eyes. Just like this morning when Blade got me to tap into my frost abilities, an unfamiliar yet welcome sensation came over me. My hands moved on their own. My feet shifted. Soon I was moving and spinning the staff as if I'd been doing it all along. All right, that's enough before you cover the entire shop in ice. Agnes muttered, annoyed. I opened my eyes, not sure what she meant. Ice surrounded me, covering the floor and creeping up the table legs and crates. Sorry, didn't even realize that was happening. I handed her the staff and nervously tugged on one braid. It was covered in a fine layer of ice. The tips were turning white. My hair. Is it supposed to do that? I held up the white ends. Agnes barely glanced at it as she moved to another table and waved me to follow. For some it does. Depends on the path you follow. I wouldn't worry about it. That's why they make hair dye. It faded back to my dark brown. How weird. You're not finished yet, one more step. I joined her at the other table. Close your eyes and hold out your hand over the stones. I took no time to see what the stones were, closed my eyes and did as she said, moving my arm from one side to the other. Nothing happened. I peeked an eye open. She frowned at me. Move slower. I shut my eyes again. What if it doesn't work? It will, Patience. She whispered something that sounded like impatient just like he was. 
My hand stilled at the words, but I made myself keep going. Like who was? Who had she been talking about? Did it have anything to do with the staff I'd picked up? Maybe another frost mage who passed through here. But she said that staff was for a necromancer. As far as I knew, there'd been no necromancer in hundreds of years. My mind was still rambling when my hand jerked to a stop, and a coolness struck my palm. Interesting indeed, Agnes mused. Open your eyes. I did, and found my hand hovering over a particular gemstone that appeared to be a cross between onyx and a sapphire. They were twisted around each other haphazardly, and at their very center was a vibrant white. Is that a pearl? Agnes picked up the stone, hefting it in her hands. It is indeed. Is that bad? I asked, unable to read her expression. No choice is ever bad. Now then, I'll have this ready for you within a week. Until then, continue your training. Good evening. She took up the staff and stone and headed to another end of the workshop. I took that as a dismissal and started for the door when I realized I'd never given her my name. Don't you need to know who I am? I asked as I turned back around. Agnes looked at me over her shoulder, those glowing yellow eyes piercing me. Oh, I know exactly who you are, Aurora Griffith. Come back in a week. No one ever called me Aurora. I'd been Rory since the beginning. I walked toward the door, an unsettling feeling hanging on my shoulders. I hit something solid, I fumbled for the handle and nearly fell out of the supply depot. I wasn't sure what or how I knew, but something was wrong with me. Or about me. About who I was. They all knew it, Moran Agnes Blade, why would no one just tell me? I wanted to call mom and demand she tell me, but a voice in the back of my mind said she didn't know either. The only explanation was that this had something to do with the man who'd been missing from my life since I was four. A man I knew absolutely nothing about. Except now I felt like maybe everyone here did know him, and mom's marriage to Trevor Griffith had all been a built on a lie. Chapter 9. Brogan. A month later. I leaned back, embracing the storm as it moved in overhead. I reached up, calling to the force of nature driving the clouds, the lightning that cracked and the resounding thunder that followed. I grew lost in the moment, not wanting it to end. And that ends training for today, Command Millie, the shaman trainer, announced. My eyes opened as I came out of my meditation and looked around lost for a few seconds while I reoriented myself with my surroundings. I wasn't sure how well I'd actually done today, until I glanced at my hands. I smiled. Lightning shot from the ends of my fingertips. It had taken nearly the whole first month here, but with Millie's help, I managed to get myself attuned to nature again. I even had a focus now, and had been striving toward building that focus and connection for the past week. You are coming along quite well, Millie said. I climbed to my feet. Thank you, took a while but I'm feeling pretty good now. Good. Victor says he's quite impressed, and that you no longer seem so bogged down by the legacy behind you. True. I'm not. Not at all. I had been, and it stopped me every time from achieving what I had done already. Rory had tried to talk me through my concerns, but the fear of failure had been too much. Victor finally just let me have it one day, and told me that no matter who came before me in my line, the only power that mattered at the moment was my own. That, and how I was able to connect with the world around me. Victor was another shaman, a third year, and I trusted him. I shoved aside the expectations of my family, and the moment I let myself relax and return to those three years I spent alone, where there'd been no pressure. I'd found myself again, nature waiting for me. Until tomorrow then, Millie said to all of us, then she walked off. Brogan. Rory approached. I was just going to come and find you. Ready for lunch. Starving. She slipped her arm through mine. Blade is trying to kill us. Nah, just building up your strength. Some days I wish all I had to do was meditate, she sighed and winked at me. It's more than that, takes an intense amount of focus. And patience. Something we both know you do not have. 
I try. And fail, I said with a laugh. She nodded in agreement. Whatever. Let's just go get some food before I fall over. Have to go back at it this afternoon. More training. Blade seems to think something's holding my frost magic back. Not mentally, but... I don't know. He seems worried about it. She tugged on the end of the long braid draped over her shoulder. In the last month, we'd grown closer, but it was hard to say we were a couple or anything, when we only ever got to see each other at meals, and every now and then on the weekends if we weren't busy catching up on sleep or working with other mages and shamans to perfect what we learned during the week. It was a hard routine, but I found I enjoyed being here more than I'd expected. Rory made it all the more so. And in our short time of getting to know each other, I'd gotten used to stopping her when she tugged on her hair anytime something bothered her. I reached over to stop her now, but froze when I caught sight of her hair. I pulled her to a halt and faced her. What, what's wrong? She asked quietly. Brogan. Your hair, it's turning white. I showed her the end of her braid, the tip stark against the dark brown. Is it supposed to do this? She took her braid from me and nibbled at her lip. Usually, it has faded back to normal by now. Is this bad? I don't know. I don't know a lot of things, it seems. You're referring to the matter that everyone seems to know about you. She told me what happened with Agnes when she had her staff made. The piece was magnificent and seemed to work well for her, but I was concerned that Agnes knew who Rory was before she even gave her name. There was a reason that Agnes knew me, but Rory wasn't a legacy. Rory had mentioned Moran and Blade talking a lot while she trained the last few weeks. As we started walking, I resisted the urge to pull her closer. As though that would keep Moran from deciding to suddenly whisk her away for the elite guard. We still had a lot to learn about each other, but I was always drawn to her, thinking about her, sensing her before she approached sometimes. We got along well, and it was nice having someone like her here, someone I could talk to about anything and not feel as if I was bothering her. Moran was watching me two days ago, I told her. I'd argued with myself over the last few days if I should keep it to myself. I thought that she had enough on her mind, but the words slipped out. And? And nothing. He said nothing to me, but he was talking to Millie pretty intensely. You think we should be worried? No one said anything about an attack, though all the commanders seemed to be on edge lately. Her voice was a whisper as we neared the hall. I'm sure they would tell us if there was a threat, I said, but couldn't help but feel the same. Like we were all holding our breaths, standing at the edge of an abyss just waiting to fall over into nothingness. Of late even my dreams had been more volatile, ending with my waking drenched in a cold sweat, with the strangest sensation that I needed to protect Rory from an unseen enemy. We walked into the hall with the other recruits, grabbed a few sandwiches and water, then headed to our usual table. It was empty, and we both looked around for a few minutes, then finally began digging into our food. You think he's all right? she asked, picking at her bread. I don't know. Haven't actually talked to him in weeks. She was talking about him. Chaz. As much as the guy irritated me in the beginning, I'd had a few civil conversations with him. He wasn't the easiest guy to get along with, but I saw the weight of whatever he carried in his eyes and the stress lines on his face. Whatever he was going through was hitting him hard. I passed him yesterday in the dorm, but all he did was growl as he walked by, barely making eye contact. I didn't even see him training with the other druids. There were rumors of a beast roaming the woods, something told me it was Chaz out there in bear form. No one else seemed to worry about him, except Rory and me. And I wasn't even sure why I did. How are your totems coming along? Rory asked. I gave up looking for Chaz and dug into my lunch. Better than before, I guess, I explained in between bites. Still a bit shaky. Don't last long. Patience, she teased, and her knee brushed against mine under the table. Right, like you're one to talk. I scooted a bit closer so our shoulders touched, and she leaned against my side. I wanted to share another kiss like our first one, but the moment just never seemed to be right. 
or available. And Rory was not a woman, I wanted to just give a light peck on the cheek. I did every chance I could anyway, but we both wanted more than that, I could tell. And your staff? I managed to smoke Blade in the face today. By accident. She cringed. I burst out laughing. He's going to have a black eye, not sure he's going to find it amusing tomorrow. No, but I will. Look at you, beating up your commanding officer. I clicked my tongue at her. She nudged me hard enough to nearly fall out of my seat. We kept elbowing each other until my arm wound up draped around her shoulders, and I breathed her in, softly kissing the top of her head. She rested against me, her skin so much cooler now that she was following the frost path. You sure you're all right? I asked her quietly. I've been thinking about my dad, she whispered. What for? She would told me what she could remember. About her and her mom being happy, until Trevor just up and left them without a word. If I was her, I wouldn't want anything to do with him, and she'd sounded like she was on the same page when she told me about him. Now I wasn't so sure. Dunno. But he's been on my mind a lot lately. Remember the garden I told you about? At our house? Yeah. And the trees that died. You said your mom was a better baker than a gardener. She laughed lightly. Yeah, she is. But what if it was more than that? I leaned back and studied her face. What do you mean? Before she could tell me, a recruit appeared at our table handing us two missives. From Commander Moran. What for? Rory asked, but he was walking away. Anyone else get these? I glanced around the hall. No one else seemed to have any. Interesting. Guess we should open them. She was tapping her fingers on the table, studying at the missive. Her face said she'd rather destroy it. I opened mine. She did the same with a mumbled curse. We unfolded the messages inside. I frowned. That's not what I was expecting to read. Yeah. Weird, she agreed. Is this really from Moran? Is stationary and seal. Yours say the same thing. I glanced over at her letter. All that was on both pages was a location and a time, nothing about what it was for or who would be there. Don't have long before we have to get over there. Wait. This is at the outpost, she asked sharply. Why would we be going there? We'll figure it out when we get there. No panicking. I'll be right there with you. She rested against me again, and I kept my arm around her, but the conversation was over. All I could think of was why Moran would want to see us at the outpost. Rory tugged on her braid over and over again, but whether she was thinking about this afternoon or her dad, I wasn't sure. Chapter 10 Brogan At one o'clock, Rory and I stood outside the main gate to the outpost. Two guards asked us our names. We gave them, and then waited as he radioed to whoever he had to run them by. We held the letters in our hands, but he didn't ask for them. Can you tell us what this is about? I asked the guard. He shrugged. Sorry, they don't tell me anything except who to let in and out. Figures, Rory mumbled. I gave her hand a quick squeeze to give her encouragement. A voice came back over the radio, giving us permission to enter. Go straight to the training dome, the uniformed guard instructed, motioning us toward a path to the right. Do not go anywhere else. That building is the only one you are authorized to be in. Understood. We nodded. He stepped aside so we could enter. He remained at his post and the gate slid shut with a loud clang. Rory moved a bit closer to me, and together we walked toward the path to the right and the domed building that lay at the end. Neither of us spoke, but when my hand brushed against Rory's, I flinched at the sudden coldness of her fingertips. A glance back revealed a trail of frost behind us. Her nerves were getting the best of her. Despite the frosty temperature of her hand, I took it and didn't let go until we reached the building. Two more guards waited at the doors. All around, others hurried from one place to another, many seemed frantic. You think something happened to our families? 
Rory whispered. No. They wouldn't bring us here. I knew my words didn't sound very confident. I spotted the elite guard, still down one member, rushing toward the main building with dark looks on their faces. I regretted not checking in with my family that morning to see if everything was all right. They're fine, I said again, probably hoping to convince myself. Commander Moran is waiting for you inside, one of the guards said as the other opened the door. I suggest you don't keep him waiting. I wasn't sure what I expected, but the space we stepped into led through another set of double doors. Beyond that was a massive room. Mats lined the floor and the walls. The ceiling was far overhead, much higher than what it appeared to be from outside. There were a few dummies against the farthest end of the domed space. Striding through another set of doors were Chaz and Moran. Chaz did not look at all too happy to be here. Rory. Brogan. Welcome, Moran announced as he walked over to greet us, leaving Chaz brooding on the other side of the dome. I hope this will not disrupt your regular training too much. I shook the hand he offered, as did Rory. No, I said uncertainly. I'm sure we'll be fine, but we'd both like to know what exactly is going on. Are we in trouble for something we did? Or didn't do? Quite the opposite. I have brought you two here today, because I believe that Rory, you, and Chaz are compatible. What? Rory snapped. Moran seemed taken aback by her harsh tone. I would have thought to find you both delighted at the potential path this brings you to. Rory was shaking her head, marching away from him toward the door. I'm afraid I can't let you leave just yet, Moran said firmly. She stopped at the doors, ready to walk out. I do not want this to turn into an order, but if it comes down to it, then I will. I told all recruits quite clearly at the beginning of training that I would be searching for those to bring into the elite guard. You three are the ones I choose. For first years, Rory whirled around, tugging on her braid and her brown hair turning whiter. I just figured out what path I'm on. And now you want me to see if I'm compatible? Yes, Moran replied. She paused, her eyes narrowing. Why us? Beg pardon. I said why us, Rory repeated. Chaz is incredible, and I know who trained him, so I get why you want him to be an elite. Brogan is a legacy, but something tells me that's not the only reason you've picked him. And me, I'm no one. So why the hell do you want the two of us here? I crossed my arms, wondering the same, actually. Moran had watched us both closely over these last few weeks, but I had yet to do anything extraordinary, and Rory admitted several times that her frost magic seemed wonky, like she was missing something. We were not the ideal candidates I would place with someone as exceptional as Chaz was. Moran straightened, his jaw set, and I waited for the orders to come out of his mouth, but it was Chaz who spoke first. Just tell them or I will, he growled. You have no right to keep secrets from them if you're asking them to become elites. Secrets? About what? I asked. I knew who in my family had gone down this same path. Knew I was a legacy. What secrets did Moran know about my family that I didn't? Moran threw Chaz a look over his shoulder. Chase smirked at him. I'm not going to stand here and let you do to them what you did to me. Tell them or I'll walk out too. Orders be damned. And furthermore, I'll tell the entire campus what else you've been keeping quiet. What is going on? Rory asked, panic creeping into her voice. Would someone just tell us the truth? I'll make you a deal. Moran paced around Rory and me. You agree to see if you are compatible with Chaz, work with him, and I will tell you the second half of why I chose you three specifically. For now, I will simply give my reason for why we are in such dire need of another elite guard. That is the deal, take it or I will do as I said before. I'll command you to come here every day until you finally do as I have required. Chaz stepped up. Moran scowled at him in warning. And if you tell them before I can, there will be hell to pay. Understand me. That is a direct order. Chaz's fists clenched but he bobbed his head and remained where he was, mouth closed. I glanced at Rory who shrugged at me, clearly at a loss. 
Guess we don't have a choice then, do we? I finally said. Deal. Why are we here? Our magic communities have been under attack for the last 17 years by an anti-magic terrorist group calling themselves the Cleansers, Moran said, not wasting any time. Wait what? Rory shook her head. We would have known. No, you would not have, because the Vanguard has been keeping it a secret from those not directly involved, to stop mass panic, Moran explained. Magic users have turned up, driven mad, a danger to themselves, to others. Many stripped of their powers altogether. That why? I said quietly, glancing at Chaz. Chaz's eyes narrowed more. Moran was moving again, agitated, his brow furrowing even more. Somehow, this group has grown more sophisticated in their attacks over the years. They've hit us where it hurts in many ways. They managed to target our elite guards, have taken several as captive over the years and killed many more. He stopped walking and looked at each of us in turn, then he continued. They have also somehow found a way to prevent us from finding magic users that are compatible. That's not possible, I said, confused. We have no explanation for how they are carrying out these attacks so effectively, since they don't use magic. If there is a magic user aiding them in some way, he or she will be brought to justice with the rest of them. Moran grunted several curses. They're fanatics and criminals, nothing more. But we need to stop them before they escalate this any further. And the elite guard we've seen here. Where's their fourth member? Rory asked. Where are the other teams? He's been in quarantine since they returned weeks ago. He's been corrupted, just like the others that have gone mad. As far as the other teams, two have been killed off. The other two are on a mission. They should be returning within a few weeks. My jaw dropped at the news. How could two teams just be killed and no one knew about it? And you want us to what? Train and then go off and fight them. You're joking, right? This all has to be some damn sick joke, Rory yelled. I can't fight anyone like that. I can barely hold my own against Blade in training, and you're going to send us to the front lines of a war that we didn't even know about? that I'm not qualified to fight in. Not a war, Moran corrected. Not yet, Chaz added. Moran gave him a glare for his input. Chaz wouldn't be stopped. I'm being honest. It's a damned war, whether you want to admit it or not. You will be trained, of course, Moran went on, speaking to Rory. By me, by Sister Agnes and all the other top commanders. Even by the elite guard. No one is going to rush you out there, unless you're ready. I care for those in my command, Griffith, it is important you know that. Her eyes narrowed as she stared him down. Why? Moran's backed up a step. It simply is. Now then, are you three ready to begin? Wait. Don't we need a fourth? I glanced at the doors, expecting another person to join us. We should have four. Not this time. Why not? I pushed. Because you will not need four, trust me. Moran, to the head of the room. Take your places please, and we shall begin. Rory, Chaz and I stood in a line in front of Moran. The tension in the room skyrocketed. I had never seen an elite guard function together as a team, and wasn't sure what we were even supposed to expect. The powers of the elite guard were meant to work together as one. It was hard to see how that would be possible, when at least two of us were just now focusing figuring out what we were good at and what we could control. Rory, your staff will be required, Moran instructed. She hesitated, but then sucked in a breath and snapped her fingers. Her metallic staff appeared in her hand, the unique stone glowing at the top. Her icy blue eyes lightened even more as her power flowed easily through her veins. Her fingertips frosted as she gripped her staff. The sight was beyond impressive, and damned if I didn't find her even more attractive at that moment. But then the white crept up her dark braid even more. I wondered if there was something she should be concerned about, like maybe her abilities changing her in ways she could not come back from. Brogan and Chaz, prepare yourselves, Moran ordered. How? I asked watching Chaz. Chaz closed his eyes, clearly feeling the rush of his living power. 
that power swirled around his hands in lazy vortexes of green and blue. Call on your lightning. I haven't been able to do that inside yet. I hated to admit the truth, but there it was. Direct contact with nature had fueled my abilities, and to do so inside a structure so massive was a challenge I hadn't been able to conquer yet. That is what Chaz is for. He will have to be your link to nature, Moran said. Moran was a shaman too, but he said that as if linking my power to another person's was so damned easy. Chaz glowered straight ahead. Unsure about what I was doing, I drew on the well of power within me that was always waiting to be used. I sensed it creeping up through my body. When it began to fizzle out, I closed my eyes and searched for a connection to nature. With my eyes shut, I was able to see the haze surrounding my body reaching out toward Chaz. Another haze surrounded him, one that was far from welcoming. Our powers barely touched, and we were both thrown back a few yards. Damn it, I snapped, sucking in a deep breath as I held my gut. What the hell was that, man? I've never done this before either, Chaz growled, shaking out his messy hair. My defenses went up. Can't help it. You both are wasting time, Moran snapped. If you were out in the field right now, you'd be dead. All of you. Now again. We might not be compatible, I spat out. And I say you have not tried hard enough. Concentrate. You three must become one. Fight as one. Your powers must be able to meld as if they come from one mind, he lectured, staring us down. Again. We took our places once more, and this time, Chaz and I made eye contact for a brief moment, then we both closed our eyes. There was a willingness to try in his gaze, but I sensed he was holding back. Something about his stance said he suspected the truth about why Moran chose Rory and me. Whatever it was, I felt he was purposely trying not to let me in, as if that would prevent us from becoming a team. But we had no choice. My magic reached out again, and this time, I tapped into the living natural force that was a part of any druid, woven into a druid's very being. Lightning crackled to life at my fingertips, and I opened my eyes, I shot a look at Chaz. His eyes glowed bright green, and a streak of lightning shot through his gaze. Good, very good, Moran commented. Now attack me. Just like that. Rory gripped her staff harder. More frost rose up her arm. Yes. You three must use each other and be as one. Now attack me. I had been ready to say no, but Moran came at us. I moved on instinct, lashing out with lightning as Chaz shifted into his bear form. Rory dove to the left, away from us. It was probably the worst bit of fighting I'd ever witnessed in my life. And it only got worse as the session went on. Again and again, Moran threw us to the floor easily, tearing us apart when we tried to stick together. He struck Chaz's bear form so hard it actually took him out of his bear. Chaz staggered to his feet, shaking from the sudden change. Moran went after him, but Rory and I were there to block the attack, her frost mingling with my lightning as we stopped Moran. For a second, I thought we might have been getting the hang of it. Until Moran yelled, and a burst of wind tossed the three of us into the far wall as if we were weightless. Rory hit her head with a curse and dropped her staff, dropping to the floor. Chaz and I both reached out to her. I'm all right, she muttered darkly, wincing as she held her head. Shit, maybe not. Moran stalked closer, eyeing us. I expected him to admit he was wrong, but instead he inclined his head. A slight smile curled his lips. Worst training session I've ever witnessed, but there is hope. Until tomorrow, I suggest you three get some rest. He pointed at Chaz. Remember what I told you. And then he walked away, leaving us there to lick our wounds and curse him. You sure you're all right? I asked Rory. She leaned against the wall, cringing and holding her head. I can't do this, she whispered. I'm not a damned fighter. We don't have a choice, Chaz reminded us both, closing his eyes, his body shaking. Is it really so bad that he has to do this? Rory asked. Chaz blew out a heavy breath and nodded. It is. I tried to talk him out of it. I really tried. I didn't think you two were ready. Hell, 
after seeing what just happened, I'm not as ready as I thought I was. His gaze shifted and he reached out for Rory's staff. He studied it the same way he'd studied her that first day. Interesting. Thanks I think. Rory took it from him. A lot of good it did me. She snapped her fingers and the staff disappeared. At least your magic held up, I pointed out. Yeah, barely. What do you mean? Chaz asked. It's been flickering in and out, Rory told him. Blade acts like there's something blocking it from its full potential, but I have no idea what that's about. Chaz suddenly was very interested in a thread on his pants. You know, don't you, I said quietly. You know why he picked us. All I have are suspicions, nothing more. I would tell you but, let's just say I learned about a dark secret from my past. And honestly, I wish I hadn't. That's your choice. I want to know, I insisted. And I can't tell you, Chaz shot back with a growl. Let it go for now. Let it go. We just found out there's practically a war going on, and that we're going to be forced to possibly fight these terrorists. And you want me to let go of whatever Moran knows about my own family that I don't. I snapped, losing patience, something I rarely did. I'm trying to protect you, man. Like you tried to protect me by blocking me from your power. Exactly. You have no idea what's out there right now. No idea what it's like. Oh. And you do. Hey. Both of you shut the hell up, all right? Rory snapped. Ice formed on the floor around where she was sitting. She gave a shudder, then grimaced. We won't be able to get through this at all, if we're at each other's throats. I opened my mouth to argue, until the frost crept even further up her braid. My worry for her overrode whatever else was going on, and I got to my feet. Come on, let's get you back to the dorm so you can rest. I helped her up slowly, supporting her. Chaz was on his feet a second later, taking her other side. Part of me wanted to snap at him to back off, but he was concerned about her too. We didn't speak as we left the domed building and took the path that would lead us to the gate exiting the outpost. I expected Chaz to leave us there, but he walked all the way across the campus lawns to the dorm building. A few curious onlookers kept asking if Rory was all right, and we all smiled and nodded, assuring everyone she was fine. I can make it from here, Rory told us at the door. You sure? I asked. I can walk you up. I'm not the only one hurting here. Guess I'll see you both at dinner. If I can manage to get my ass out of bed. She squeezed my hand and gave Chaz a wave, then entered the dorm, moving slowly. I sighed, wanting to stay with her and make sure she was really all right, but stayed where I was. You should still tell us, I muttered to Chaz. I know, he replied, but the words were weighed down with palpable guilt and regret. Moran won't stop pushing us to work together. He doesn't give up easily. Even after today. Chaz motioned for me to walk with him to get away from any recruits who might overhear, and didn't stop until we were at the trees. As much as I hate to agree with Moran, the three of us have the potential to work together. I have my reasons for not wanting to but at the same time, you can't tell me you didn't feel that in there. I started to say no, but that'd be a lie. I had felt it. A deep connection and almost an understanding of Rory and Chaz as we fought, or attempted to fight, together. Yeah, I did, I finally admitted. You're worried about Rory. I shrugged. I am. I'm worried about all of us, actually. I came here knowing I would have to serve at some point but this is beyond what I anticipated. Especially in my first month or so here. Moran was right when he said he cares about those under his command. He won't send us out until we're ready. And what if we're never ready? What if the war grows worse and desperate times and all that shit? You can't stand there and tell me he'll hold back just because we don't think we're ready. Chaz's face grew set with a dark expression. That's what I thought. He rubbed the back of his neck as we stood in silence, listening to the leaves rustling behind us. After a while, he said he was going for a run in the woods, and he'd see me tomorrow for our training. I watched him go, 
and stayed at the edge of the trees for a long time. Eventually, I sank down to the grass and shut my eyes, reaching for the storm that was constantly brewing within me. Linking my power to Chaz's had felt odd, and I needed to get my balance back by being out here. But as I shut my eyes and reached for that storm, I pictured the three of us caught up in a battle we had no chance of winning. Chapter 11 Chaz I growled as Moran came after me again and slammed my paws onto the mats hard. Green moss erupted and shot toward him, trapping his feet within its hold. I roared for Brogan to make his move, and lightning crackled around me, then it shot out toward Moran. He raised his hands and easily deflected it, but it had given Rory a chance to get behind him. She raised her staff high in her left hand as her right shot out toward Moran, who was now our captive. Ice formed at his feet and moved up his body, trapping him. But just as it would have pinned his hands to his sides, Rory faltered, and her power cut off as if someone pulled the plug on her. She cursed. Moran easily broke out of the ice and swung his arm, catching her in a whirlwind that sent her flying across the room. Brogan yelled in fury, his hands shooting toward Moran. The drain of his magic on mine pulled me out of bear form abruptly. The endeavor backfired on both of us. We fell to the floor, sucking in breaths as our power dissipated violently, leaving us weakened. Moran stepped out of the moss and moved closer, preparing for the move that would leave us both bruised. Again. But just as he made ready to attack, Rory screamed a battle cry and threw herself at Moran. She smacked him in the back with her staff. He grunted, whirling around, but she ducked under his arm and slammed her staff into his knees. They fought hand to hand as Brogan and I struggled to regain our footing. Moran was twice her size but she held her ground, for a while at least. When she started to lose ground she slammed her staff to the floor and a wall of ice formed, blocking Moran from reaching her. Now or never, I muttered to Brogan. He nodded, and we hefted ourselves up. The strain was too much, but this was the first time in the last three weeks of these damn sessions that we had Moran on the defensive. Mostly. I opened up to my power connecting with Brogan's, and together, we attacked Moran again. The wave of living moss and vines coupled with lightning struck Moran in the back, and his body convulsed from the hit, paralyzing him. Rory. Trap him. I yelled to her. But there was no reply. Rory. The ice wall cracked down the center, and a strange darkness seeped out, spider webbing through the rest of the ice, then shattering completely. Behind it, Rory stood holding her staff. Her hair had gone completely white. Her ice blue eyes glazed over, then darkened to a strange shade of violet. Suddenly, she collapsed to the floor in a heap. Moran was the first to reach her, lifting her up and tapping her cheeks as Brogan and I rushed to her side. What the hell happened? Brogan snapped. Moran ignored his question. Placing his hand against Rory's forehead, he whispered quietly. When her eyes still didn't open, he turned to me. Fetch Sister Agnes. Quickly. I did as he asked and sprinted from the dome to one of the soldiers outside. I gave him the order, and he set off to track her down while I returned to the scene inside. Brogan was holding Rory in his lap, and the strangest punch of jealousy made me bare my teeth. Then I got a hold of myself and returned to Moran, who stared at her with a worried frown. What was that, with the ice? I asked. I've never seen that before. I have, he replied. Brogan's head shot up. Moran nodded. Once. A long, long time ago. Is she sick? Brogan asked, smoothing his fingers over Rory's now white hair. She said there was something wrong with her powers. Is it the cleansers? Are they doing this to her? Moran shook his head. No. This is something else. What? I demanded hotly. What is happening to her? Doors opened behind us. Before he could answer, Agnes appeared, silver hair flying out behind her as she ran to Rory's side. A bright white healing light surrounded her and Rory, as she laid her hand on her forehead. Rory's eyes fluttered open for a moment, but then they shut again. She trembled in Brogan's arms. She needs to rest now. Agnes glared at Moran. Is she going to be all right? Brogan asked. 
Given a few days, yes, Agnes said, not taking her gaze from Moran. A word, Commander Moran, if you don't mind. He ground his teeth but inclined his head. Chaz Brogan. Get her back to her room, please. I expect the two of you to be here tomorrow. I helped Brogan hoist Rory into his arms, and the three of us left. Rory murmured something but remained unconscious as we walked from the dome toward the gate leading back to campus. Neither of us said a word, and ignored everyone around us as we hurried back to the dorm and then up to her room. Carefully, I searched her pockets for her key, then I stopped. I can't use it. Only she can, I reminded Brogan. Try it anyway, he said, still clutching her firmly in his arms. I did as he suggested, and when the door unlocked, I frowned. That's not possible. Maybe it is, he muttered, as I opened the door and the three of us entered. Maybe we're all more connected than we realize. Carefully, he laid Rory on her bed and kissed her forehead. My gut twisted at the sight, and I forced myself to stay by the door, leaning against the wall. As he sat on the edge of her bed, watching over her. The last two weeks had been beyond intense, even compared to the training I endured while growing up here. It had brought the three of us closer together, but at the same time, we still hadn't made that genuine connection. There were walls up for all of us, ones that were not going to come down easily. It still bothered me that Rory seemed so familiar, but I couldn't place where from. Or that Brogan and she had essentially turned into a couple so fast. That made me tense without even understanding why. Rory was attractive, and I liked her spirit, but I hardly knew her well enough to be as jealous as I was of how she turned to Brogan for comfort after our hard sessions of training. Or how I constantly saw them together. Have you ever seen this before? Brogan asked, tearing me from my confused mess of a mind. I've met frost mages before not many, but a few, and I'd never seen a shadow like that appear, I replied. Or how her eyes turned violet. And her hair, Brogan muttered, running his fingers down her long braid. It's not supposed to stay like this, is it? I've never known it to stay that way. He held her hand, squeezing it as if trying to wake her up faster. Moran was different today. I crossed my arms, trying to look anywhere but their hands. He's worried. About us. No. Well partially, but mostly because of the reports that came in this morning. That bad. Five Vanguard went missing, I informed them, since Moran hadn't given me orders not to tell Brogan or Rory about it. Two more were found dead. Where? Hundred miles from here. But it gets worse. I swallowed hard. Another druid was found, his magic corrupted. He nearly killed the entire household, before they were able to get him under control. Does Moran really think he can keep this quiet forever, he muttered. Someone's going to find out eventually. I know, I've told him as much. And Agnes? What was her issue with him? I smirked. Agnes is probably giving him shit now for pushing the three of us too hard, I said, though felt it was more than that. I glanced at Rory's left hand, but the back was still blank. At some point, I had a feeling it wouldn't be. Moran let slip just a few days ago that she was the reason we would not need a fourth member to our group. I wasn't sure how that could be possible, seeing as if she was a hybrid she would have to eventually choose. The look in his eyes said he was up to something. None of that mattered. We all saw how well it went today. Her magic was going to start fighting against itself if she didn't learn the truth about who she was. And pushing us to be compatible with each other was either going to make it come out violently, or the next time, Rory might not merely collapse. Moran was playing with fire, and he damned well knew it. I growled. Brogan looked at me. What? I muttered. Nothing just, it's nothing. His hand tightened around hers again and I forced myself not to growl again. Brogan was one of the least fake people I'd ever met. I should be happy for the two of them, seeing as we were all going to be very close if Moran continued to push our training. But all I could think of was what if that were me holding Rory's hand, me sitting by her side and smoothing her hair back. If mine were the first face she saw when she came to. I wasn't sure what made me do it, 
but I walked closer, around to the other side of her bed. You care for her, I whispered to Brogan, not wanting her to overhear us talking about her. I do, he said without hesitation. She's not like anyone I've met before. True. She's not, I agreed. My gaze roamed over Rory's face, peaceful while she slept. There were a few faded bruises along her arms, matching those that we all had from our training. I blinked and imagined us in a real fight. Imagine one of us hurt or bleeding. One of us getting killed. I had grown up here at the outpost. A long time ago, I had accepted this would be my fate. But Rory and Brogan, they hadn't. The notion of either of them not coming back alive from a mission tore at me, more than it should have, considering I'd only known them for a few weeks. I knew the secrets Moran kept from them, but was it really enough to make me feel such a strong pull to them? I reached out and held Rory's other hand, wishing she had not wound up in this situation. There was no escaping it now. Moran knew we were compatible. It was on his face each time we fought. I silently made her a promise that I would not let her fate be the same as that of my parents. I did the same for Brogan. None of us chose this life, but unless we tried to run, we were about to find ourselves up to our necks in trouble. And running would only make things worse. I held Rory's hand tighter. She gasped and shot upright suddenly. Rory. Brogan reached to help her sit up. Can you hear me? She nodded, giving her head a shake. What happened? You don't remember? I asked, ready to let go of her hand, but she held on, and I sat down on the other side of the bed, closely watching her blue eyes for any sign of the violet hue returning. No, I mean, I know we were training with Moran, and I attacked him with my staff, but after that, it's all fuzzy, she murmured. Did I get hit in the head again? I exchanged a look with Brogan, neither one of us sure how to answer her. Not exactly, he finally said. Your power knocked you out. Really? She grimaced, squinting, trying to remember, then shook her head. Don't remember that at all. Great, that's great. Did we beat Moran at least? Almost, I told her. Her icy eyes turned to me. For a second I was caught off guard, not even sure why, but before I could ask her if she'd ever seen a darkness seep into her ice before, a siren wailed from outside. I shot up and rushed to the window. What is that? Brogan asked. Chaz. Emergency siren, I told them both, watching as recruits and commanders alike poured out of the buildings. Something's happened. Protocol says to report to the auditorium. Can you walk? I turned back to Rory and Brogan. She was already swinging her legs over the side of the bed. Brogan helped her upright. She took a few steps, her legs shaking so much they gave out. Damn it. We've got you, I said. Brogan and I got her out of her room and into the hall. The stairs were slow going, and the persistent wailing of the siren only made it harder to focus on getting to the main floor without falling over each other. Sister Agnes and Blade stood outside the auditorium doors. They saw us and reached out to help. How are you feeling? she asked Rory. Better, I think. You were there. Afterward, she said, her lips pursed. Get inside, the three of you. We will be having a talk, after Moran has finished explaining what's happening. What is happening? I asked her quietly. Inside, Chaz. You'll all know soon enough. What do you think happened? Brogan asked me over Rory's head. If Moran is ready to tell the entire campus about it, it can't be anything good, I grunted. The three of us managed to get into the auditorium, taking up three seats in the very back row. A few students shot us curious glances, but then Moran was up on the stage with Headmistress York, both wearing grim expressions. The siren shut off and Moran approached the mic. Here we go, I whispered to myself, knowing everything was about to change. Again. If everyone could settle down please, he requested, and the few whispered murmurs stopped immediately. I would like to tell you the siren was for a drill, but I regret to announce that was not the case. Rory held my hand in Brogan's, her eyes fixed on Moran. Exactly 42 minutes ago, 
one of the magic communities located in Wichita, Kansas, was attacked. He paused. By persons unknown. At his words, several panicked cries went up in the crowd. A few students started crying, others looked around worriedly as if expecting an attack. Settle down. Moran waved for silence. This campus and outpost are heavily warded and guarded against any attack. The chances of our being hit are slim. However, that does not mean I do not want each and every one of you to be vigilant in the days to come. This attack won't be the last against our kind. Fear filled the air. I wondered what Moran was playing at, making an announcement like this. He knew damned well who the enemy was, so why didn't he just say it? Cleansers, that's what those bastards called themselves. Idiots who wanted to rid the world of magic users. Though they were somehow using magic to do it. The irony of it. I must also ask that you are all wary of your powers moving forward, Moran went on. Corruption can spread easily. If it is allowed to fester here, it could do formidable damage. But he held up his finger, I do have good news. A new elite guard team is being trained as we speak, and I have no doubt that before long, they will be able to go out into the world and aid in bringing in those responsible for these atrocities. Is he talking about us? Rory hissed. He's not. Right? But I didn't answer. Instead, I glowered at the stage in Moran, hoping he felt my growing anger at what he was about to do to us. Brogan, Rory, and Chaz. If you will please stand. I ground my teeth. I didn't want to but found myself rising along with the other two anyway, knowing it wasn't worth the fight it would start to remain seated. Everyone turned to stare at us, a few whispering behind their hands as they appraised us, the first elite guard team in years to come from this facility. Seeing as how times are changing, these three will be removed from campus and take up new residence at the outpost, Moran added. The three of us looked at him wide-eyed. There, their training will continue. Keep in mind, I will be on the lookout for any other recruits who show promise of joining them. For those of you who have family in Wichita, the commanders will see to communications with them. Everyone else, please feel free to check in with your families and friends back home. Let them know you are safe and there is no cause for alarm. Bullshit, I muttered darkly. There's been cause for alarm for the last 15 years. Wichita isn't that far from here, Brogan said. And why isn't there more call to action against whoever did this? I don't know, but I doubt the regular government's thrilled, I said sarcastically. You don't think they're behind it, do you? Rory said worriedly. That they're fueling it somehow? Moran said it was an anti-magic group, and there are quite a few politicians who are still against us. I only know what I've been told, and sadly it isn't much, I said. But I would like to know more about these new residences of ours. Moran exited the stage and strode our way. He motioned for us to follow him out of the auditorium. We didn't go far, just down a side hall and away from the commotion. Blade and Agnes followed, keeping a close eye out. Probably so that no recruits overheard our conversation. I know I mentioned before how important it was for the three of you to find a way to work together, Moran said quietly. Now it is even more dire that you increase your training together. How many attacks have happened like the one in Wichita? Brogan asked, crossing his arms. I saw the urge in Moran's eyes not to answer, but then he sighed. Seven attacks. But this one has been the worst, with the most casualties. How many are dead? I asked. Twenty-two at last count. Twenty-two. Rory snapped. How is this not a bigger issue? Why isn't the government doing anything to protect our people? Because that's not the way the world works. These attackers are only going after magic communities. Therefore according to the law, it's a problem for the vanguard to deal with, Moran explained quickly. They won't step in unless innocent non-users' lives are at stake and these bastards have been damned careful not to do so. Well that's just great, Rory went on furiously. What the hell do you expect us to do? Train. Find your connection. Become what we all need you to be. I did not lie when I said the number of our elite 
had been depleted. The current team has already been deployed to Wichita, though I doubt they will find a trail to follow. So we're at war then, is that it? Rory muttered. Or have we been at war, and you're just now admitting it to the rest of the world? Moran said nothing. Rory shook her head, then stormed away. Brogan started to go after her, but Blade stopped him. Let her have a moment before she loses control, he said, nodding to the frozen trail she left in her wake. I longed to follow her but remained where I was. Moran and the others, who had been lying to the entire magical community, were going to be facing a shitstorm of chaos for keeping them in the dark. For not warning them that there was a credible threat. I didn't want to be a dramatic asshole, but the temptation to tell him the world as we knew it was about to change was strong. I expect you three to get settled into your new apartment at the outpost tonight, Moran said. Every day, you will be training with either myself, Agnes, or Blade. You are no longer recruits. But we still haven't fully realized if we're compatible yet, Brogan argued. I waited for Moran to give him another bullshit answer, but instead, he hung his head. Later this evening, I will meet with the three of you, and we will talk about what else I have kept secret. That surprised me, but at least now my suspicions would be addressed. I'd picked up a fair amount from eavesdropping on Agnes and Moran. For him to say that he was going to tell Brogan and Rory pissed me off though. He kept me in the dark for 17 long years. I wanted to deck him for finally realizing how much of an idiot he'd been by keeping all this to himself. From the way Agnes and Blade exchanged a worried glance, they'd known about it all too. Now I could strangle all three of them. Brogan and I watched as Moran nodded, as if confirming something to himself, then set off, leaving us alone. Guess we should go back, Brogan mumbled, shoving his hands in his pockets. Damn. This is just, are we really at war? I don't know anymore, I said, not sure what else to say at that point. Chapter 12 Chaz I packed up my things and left the dorm, without seeing Brogan. I'd considered knocking on his door, but figured he might need more time to get his head on straight. Hell, I still had no idea what to think of all this, and I'd been in the thick of it for a while now. I made it all the way to the outpost, and into what was to be our shared quarters, since we were already being considered an elite guard team. The notion secretly terrified and thrilled me at the same time. After the oath I made to avenge my parents, this promotion brought me one step closer. At the same time, so much was going to be expected of us now, and there'd be no going off on my own. Not that I wanted to drag the other two down with me, when I went about my business of taking out my parents' murderers. Rory hadn't arrived yet, so I went looking for her, wanting mostly to make sure she was all right after the whole ordeal. I wasn't sure where to even start looking, and aimlessly wandered the grounds for any sign of her. I didn't look long before I spotted Blade, hands clasped behind his back, standing outside one of the greenhouses. I wondered what he was doing, was about to ask him. I noticed the windows were completely frosted over. She come out at all yet. I approached Blade. No. And I wasn't about to go in. You're not scared of her, are you? I asked with a smirk, but when he didn't smile, I frowned. What's got you all freaked out? She's a first-year frost mage. She's not that powerful. He tilted his head from side to side. You'll understand soon enough. You going in? I considered stepping back and going to find Brogan, but instead, I walked to the door and grabbed the frozen knob. A shiver rushed down my spine, but I gritted my teeth and stepped inside. Rory! The air was frigid. My breath puffed out in front of my face. All the green leaves and brightly colored flowers were covered in a fine layer of frost, making them brittle, and giving the place an eerie, icy wonderland feel. The air was heavy with emotion. I had to be careful with my steps, take my time, so I didn't slip on the fine sheen of ice covering the floor. Rory, come on. You can't stay in here forever, I called out. You sure about that? I followed the sound of her voice to the rear of the greenhouse. She sat atop one of the work tables, her staff in her right hand, the stone pulsing as if in time with her heartbeat. You shouldn't be in here, you'll catch a cold. 
I'll be fine, I assured her, taking in her all-white hair and the icy blue of her eyes. I'm starting to like that look on you. She pursed her lips. Yeah well. Makes one of us, I guess. I leaned against one of the planters, trying to keep my teeth from chattering with the intense cold. She didn't appear phased at all by it. I almost considered shifting into bear form, but it was a bit hard to communicate in garbled growls and grunts. You know, when I was little. She spun her staff in her hand. I knew exactly what I wanted to be. Anyone asked, I said I wanted to be just like Jody Griffith. Be a baker. <laughs> Work with her, help run the bakery. She laughed bitterly and her eyes flared blue. I was such an idiot. No you weren't. You couldn't have known this would happen. None of us could, I argued. Moran could, she snapped. He knew all along what was happening, that this group of bastards was going around hurting magic users. And he and the others did nothing. Nothing. And now, I'm being turned into a damned soldier to go fight them. How is that fair? At her shout, more frost crept out of her body and covered the windows nearby. I doubted any of the plants would survive near her rage. It's not none of this is, I agreed. But this is the life we've fallen into. Shoved into it by an arrogant ass who didn't try to take care of the problem soon enough. I bristled as she insulted Moran. Look, I understand how you feel about him right now. I do, but he's still a good man who is trying to do what's right for everyone. He's doing his best to keep us all safe. By letting the magical communities walk around ignorant and blind, she shot back. By not causing panic. By only alerting those who can do something about the attackers, I said firmly. You don't know the whole situation. This group, these people, they're not just humans with guns and bombs. Whatever they're doing is damaging our kind at the DNA level. Messing us up for good. We don't have enough intel to know how they're doing it. And there's no way to stop it until we do. Announcing that we are at a complete loss would only make things worse. You're just saying that because he's practically your dad, she muttered furiously, hopping down from the table. He should have told the truth. You wouldn't understand his reasoning. Right, course not, since I didn't grow up at an outpost. My apologies for having normal parents. At least you had a mom, I growled. I lost my parents. I know, you told me. But look where you ended up, trained by the best. And you just stand there and expect Brogan and I to magically be masters, to become soldiers. I don't want this life of violence. I came here because I have to, not to be turned into some, some damned killer. The window behind her shattered as it failed to hold the weight of more frost. The glass shards flew everywhere. I grabbed for Rory, tugging her out of the way as the window crashed to the floor. Get off me, she snapped, shoving herself away from me. Just leave me alone. Not going to happen, not anymore. You and Brogan and I, as much as you're going to hate to admit it, we're in this together. She gripped her staff harder and the stone pulsed even brighter. She was on the verge of losing control, but another voice called her name and she stilled. Blade had come inside after all. Enough, he commanded. Get control of yourself now. Understand me? What do you think I've been trying to do? Failing to do you mean, he grunted. This is not how one of the elite guard acts when the world is falling apart around her. I am not an elite guard. Not yet, he corrected quietly. You will get through this, Rory. You just have to have faith in yourself. In your companions. She scoffed at his words but slowly the frost receded from the greenhouse, melting and bringing color back to the building. She was muttering under her breath as she snapped her fingers and her staff disappeared. Good, now get packed and get your ass over to the outpost. Moran will be with you shortly. I let Rory lead the way, but once we were outside she stormed away from me, shooting a glare over her shoulder. Fine. If she wanted to take her anger at Moran out on me, that was just freaking fine. She stalked away. I spun around and marched my ass straight back to our new apartment to wait for Moran. I sat in one of the armchairs, barely nodding at Brogan when he finally arrived. 
The door opened a few seconds after he came in. Rory didn't even look at me, just went back to one of the bedrooms and slammed the door shut hard enough to shake the walls. Heard you two had a great talk, Rogan commented as he sat down in another chair. Something like that, I muttered. She needs time, he said quietly. She's not used to this life. I frowned at him, wondering if he was about to confirm one of my suspicions. And you are? He folded his hands on his knee and watched the door. Yeah, I am. I waited for him to say more, but a knock came at the door. I went to answer it, and found Moran and Agnes standing on the threshold. I stepped aside for them to enter. Moran looked around the living room. Where's Griffith? Right here, Rory snapped as she exited the hall leading to the bedrooms. She crossed her arms tightly and refused to come any closer, choosing instead to stand at the back of the room. Moran didn't seem to be bothered by her reaction and took his place on the couch, Agnes right beside him. Are your new accommodations acceptable? Just get to the point, Rory spat. What's going on? Why did you pick us? Moran leaned back against the couch. Chaz, would you like to explain your circumstances first? Or Brogan? I shot Brogan a sideways glance. His face paled. I will, he uttered voice raspy. I'm a legacy, but you both know that already. What I did not tell you, and the only thing I can think of that Moran is referring to, is that my uncle Grayson was one of the elite guard. He was? Rory asked. Brogan glanced at her. He was. Never told you because it's a sore spot within my family. They didn't want him to be one. I asked. No, he, uh, he disappeared about 18 years ago, he said slowly. No one's seen or heard from him since. Not a trace. No idea if he's dead or alive. A hush fell over the apartment. I'd assumed Brogan had someone he knew in the vanguard, some high-ranking officer perhaps, but I had not expected a relative of his to be part of the elite fighting force. No wonder he seemed so worried about doing his best all the time. He said 18 years though. I looked at Moran, but his face gave nothing away. Chaz. Care to go next? Moran asked. I wasn't sure I could handle telling them everything, but either it came from me, or it came from Moran. I'd rather they hear it from me. My parents were both elite guards, I started. They were sent on a mission to investigate this group that's attacking our people. Their team. I cleared my throat. Their team was overwhelmed, two of their members taken captive. Or killed. I blew out a heavy breath, feeling Rory's eyes on me. The bastards figured out who my parents were, and came after them and me. They were killed when the safe house was attacked. You said that happened 17 years ago, Rory said quietly. I did. She was looking between Brogan and me, her brow furrowed. Were they on the same team? Moran lowered his head slightly. They were. What? Brogan blinked a few times as he struggled to take in the news. His parents, my uncle, they knew each other? That they did. They were part of one of the greatest fighting teams we've ever seen, Agnes said this time. It was a tragedy to lose them all in such a violent way. Okay, Rory said slowly. I get why you picked Chaz and Brogan. But why me? I shouldn't be here. You of all of them should be here, Moran said. The three of us stared at him intensely, waiting to finally understand what the big secret was linking us all together. Your father is Trevor Griffith, and he was by far one of the best elite guardsmen I ever had the privilege of working with. That Brogan's uncle and Chaz's parents had the honor of knowing. They knew each other? I did a double take. Which means we knew each other as kids. Moran nodded in confirmation. Your parents and her father were very close. You two knew each other when you were very young. I remember, I whispered, studying Rory. But that's not right, she argued. My mom, she never said anything about dad being a, uh, whatever he was. Not a damned word. She never knew what he was, Moran told her. He wanted to keep you both as safe as possible. Your mother just assumed Chaz's parents were family friends. And when he disappeared. 
Her gaze landed on me. The team, they were all on a team together. So my dad and Brogan's uncle. Are they dead? We don't know, Moran answered honestly. They didn't make it out, that's all we ever heard. Rory was bobbing her head as though she'd heard him, but she seemed so lost all of a sudden. Brogan rose to his feet, probably go to her. She held up her hand, stopping him. I need a minute. You mind? None of us said anything as she retreated to her bedroom, and the door shut soundly behind her. I sat in my chair. Every time I blinked, another sliver of a memory surfaced. Of Rory and me running through a backyard garden. Rory and her braided hair, the smell of fresh cakes her mom baked in the kitchen. And then it all came to an end when our parents and Brogan's uncle walked into a trap. You think that we can work together because they did, Brogan said after a while of silence. I do, Moran agreed. But we're still missing one member of a full team, I pointed out. Someone else's kid we don't know about. I wanted him to admit the truth, but his eyes said he wasn't going to. Agnes opened her mouth as if to do it for him, but Moran talked over her. You will understand in time. Now, I will leave you three to rest for tomorrow, your full days of training will begin. I suggest you prepare yourselves for it, however you must. He glanced toward the hallway as if he wanted to speak with Rory again, but thought better of it. He and Agnes left a moment later, leaving me and Brogan staring at each other. Of all the ways I saw today ending, this was not it. I had answers, but there wasn't a chance in hell the three of us were getting out of this alive now. I willed for Rory to come out of her room so I could talk to her, but she stayed in there for the rest of the night. I let her be, not wanting to be frozen solid when she lashed out in her anger and pain. Chapter 13 Rory The three days after Moran told me who my dad really was passed in a blur. I fell into our new routine of training only at the outpost, of living with Brogan and Chaz. Chaz, who I'd apparently known as a kid because his parents and my dad had been friends, had kept the truth from mom all that time to keep us safe. And then, I wound up being a mage anyway. The garden, the trees dying after dad left, I wanted to blame that on his being a mage, but wasn't sure how that would even happen. I'd gone to Agnes last night and asked her more about my father. All she told me was that we were very much alike, and he was one of the greatest frost mages she'd ever witnessed. And he was strong, she'd added quietly. So strong, each time he had to go on another mission and leave you both behind. What do you mean? He never told mom anything, I'd argued. And that was the hardest part. Leaving and knowing he might never come back. He was an exceptional man, Rory, and one day you'll have to forgive him for leaving. He didn't want to, not that last time. He didn't? No, she'd replied. He told Moran they needed more information before heading in, but Moran was desperate. Sent them in anyway. And he's regretted it ever since. I had no doubt he did, since Brogan's uncle and my dad was killed. Then Chaz's parents, having to go into hiding, before they too were finally hunted down and murdered. If his mom hadn't hidden him away, Chaz would have been slaughtered too. This group of people who hated us so much, they'd been getting away with destroying our kind for over a decade. But no more. When I looked at Moran now, really looked at him, he had a deadly determination in the set of his jaw to put an end to this madness. The glint in his eye told me he expected us to be able to do it, to be the ones to stop this fight before it did turn into a full-blown war. But I was still in a battle with myself. Angry at everything in my life that had been a damned lie. Rory, move damn it. Chaz shouted. I turned around, then dropped to the floor at the last second. The fireball shot over me, and I shook my head, trying to get back into the present moment. Are you trying to get yourself killed? I glared at Chaz but didn't say anything. I gripped my staff firmly as I faced down our enemies for the day. Blade and Agnes. Moran was too busy dealing with incoming intel to be the one training us. Hiding away was more like it. As much as he looked at the three of us as if we were going to be his saving grace, 
I thought I caught a sliver of fear in his face when his gaze landed on me. As if, out of the three of us, I would be the one to snap and go after him. He was right about that. Blade yelled as he launched a wave of fire toward us. I blocked it with a wall of ice. You with us today? Or what? Chaz growled. Blade's fire worked at melting down the wall. I'm here, aren't I? Physically, but mentally you checked out the night Moran told you the truth. Snap out of it. I wanted to scream back at him, but the fire suddenly exploded through my ice wall. Brogan stepped up to shoot lightning toward our targets, making them duck behind several barricades that had been added to our makeshift battlefield. Both of you get it together, Brogan urged. This is not the time to argue. No. It's the perfect time to argue, Chaz roared back. If she can't get it together and get over it, then we don't stand a chance. We're all going to die. Don't you dare put that on me. I yelled, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. It's the truth, isn't it? You know how dire the circumstances are, and you knew who our parents were. This is our destiny now. Our legacy. Accept it and move on. I opened my mouth to bellow. A blast of holy light drove us all apart and threw me across the floor. I screamed curses, at the end of what little patience I ever had to begin with, and slammed my staff into the floor once I regained my footing. Frost shot out from every direction as my power surged, covering the floors and walls, the barricades, reaching for friend and foe alike. It struck Chaz, and he growled as it tried to creep up his body. Then I ran out of strength and slumped on my staff. You just attacked me. Good, I snarled. I'm sick of you acting like this is okay. Nothing about this is okay. None of it. A green and blue vortex swirled around his hands as he stalked toward me. I am sorry you had to find out about your dad this way. I am. But you have to get your shit together. This is your life now, Rory. This is where you belong. Maybe I don't want this life. I shook my head, feeling more frost stretch up my arms to my shoulders as if it could keep away the harsh truth he threw at me. Maybe, I wanted to be normal. And not a soldier. I can't kill, I can't be like the man I never even got to know. You should be proud to follow in his footsteps, Chaz said firmly, squaring his shoulders. I am. And you want to follow them to their deaths, is that it? I laughed bitterly, tossing my staff to my other hand. You and Moran deserve each other. You don't care about us. About what we're ready for. I can't do this. I'd been falling apart piece by piece since Moran announced the truth about who I was. But now, the rest of me crumbled. All the strength went out of my limbs, and I held myself up with my staff feeling as if nothing would ever be the same again. It wouldn't. I was going to be thrown into a war one wasn't ready for. Violence, pain, killing? I was not that type of person, wasn't strong enough to survive it. Surely Moran and the others had to see that? Rory Chaz called out. I glanced up, hardly able to lift my head. Agnes and Blade had stopped their assault and stood off to the side, watching. Chaz continued, You are the daughter of Trevor Griffith, a frost mage of extraordinary power and strength of will. And how do you know that, huh? How do you know he wasn't weak, like me? I know, Agnes said, stepping forward. I know how much he sacrificed for our families and friends, to keep us all safe. But he struggled too. He did. He was kind-hearted, a good person just like you are. And every time he came back from a mission, it took him days to pull himself together enough to return home. I shut my eyes, remembering what details I could about Dad's face. His eyes had been ice blue just like mine. But I'd have sworn I remembered a tinge of violet in them, now and again. Sometimes he looked sad too, and I would go sit on his lap to try to cheer him up. We'd sit in the garden for hours, he'd tell me about the flowers and trees, talking about the cycle of life and death and how much power it held. I never understood his words then, but now they struck me so hard it was like someone had shoved a blade through my chest. I gasped and sank to the floor, unable to hold myself up any longer. Arms cut my fall. 
Tears of ice glided from my eyes as my staff slipped from my fingers. I turned my head, expecting to see Brogan, but instead my eyes locked with green ones. Chaz looked back at me intensely, holding me in his lap on the floor. I know you think I'm taking this lightly, he murmured, but I'm not. Honestly, I'm terrified of what's going to happen once we leave this outpost. Really? He nodded. A shadow loomed over us, then Brogan sat down beside us. Same. I'm a legacy, and though my uncle was an elite, I go to sleep at night fearing I'll never be what he was. You're not alone, Rory. Chaz helped me sit up so that we formed a small circle. We're in this together, from the start until whatever, whenever. His hand found mine as did Brogan's. And if I fail you both? I asked quietly. If I can't be like my dad? Don't be. Just be you. But you have to stop doubting yourself, Brogan said. Been telling you that since day one. Feel the power that's inside you. You're damn strong. You just have to let yourself believe. I hung my head, squeezing each of their hands in turn. The connection I sensed the first time Moran threw us together had grown stronger, especially now that I was starting to remember parts of my past. Especially involving Chaz. As for Brogan, I'd felt close to him from the moment I fell into his lap. Fate, some would call it. I rested my head against Brogan's shoulder and closed my eyes, letting myself be in the moment with them. Our knees touched, and despite the cold that I'd grown accustomed to within me, a strange warmth rose bursting out of me. There was a murmured gasp behind me. I opened my eyes. What the hell? I was startled by the sight. Yeah. Definitely what the hell, Chaz agreed, eyes wide. Think Moran was right after all. Brogan merely nodded, seeming at a loss for words. The floor beneath us had become a mix of bright green moss dotted with white and purple flowers. The blooms were dusted with frost, and there was a fine sheen of ice beneath the moss. Behind us, dancing in an ever-moving circle were violet and blue lightning strikes. The lightning was soundless but protected us. Our three abilities had combined in a perfect moment of unity. Well now, Agnes announced as she and Blade stood close by watching the spectacle. I'd say you three deserve the rest of the day to yourselves. She smiled proudly and walked out of the room. Blade followed, leaving the three of us alone. Curious, I reached out and let the lightning struck my palm. I flinched but there wasn't any pain, just heat, and the sensation that this came from Brogan. His presence was here just as Chaz's was. Even if I closed my eyes again, I still felt them. You really think we can pull this off? I kept my eyes closed. Don't have a choice, Chaz replied. The serious tone in his voice threw me off. Meaning what? Chaz swallowed hard and abruptly stood, breaking the circle. I found out about my parents a few months ago. In my rage, I might have done something stupid. And that would be what? I asked slowly, not liking how he'd turned his back to us. Chaz? He hung his head, hands on his hips as he muttered, I swore an oath on my druidic powers to avenge my parents' deaths. Are you insane? I shouted. At the same time, Brogan groaned in annoyance. I was pissed all right, he growled, whirling back around. I just, I did it without thinking. Clearly, Brogan said. At the time I was alone, Chaz went on. I had no idea this would happen, that we'd be compatible. I want them dead. I want them to pay for what they stole from me. Now if we don't succeed, if we do fail you lose everything, I whispered. Chaz, how could you do that to yourself? He shrugged, backing toward the door. I'm sorry. Sorry? You just added more weight to this burden we're already carrying. Now we have to hunt them down and kill them before we lose you. I had no idea how any of this was going to be possible. You don't even know who they are or where they are. I know, all right. I know and I'm sorry, but it's too late now. I can't take it back. We'll figure this, Brogan started. Chaz turned around and headed for the door. Where are you going? Brogan sat up straighter. I need time to think. I'll see you both later, he mumbled. And then Chaz was gone. I started to go after him, but Brogan grabbed my hand, stopping me. 
Give him time. We can't let him lose his powers. That oath. We won't. But we can't do anything about it now. Damned fool made an oath. Nothing can break it. Only fulfilling it will take care of it. I looked at the doors, wishing we'd known about all of this, including our connection sooner. Maybe we could have stopped him from making this mistake, but Brogan was right. Too late to do anything about it now, except hunt down the damned cleansers and get our revenge. I gulped, still unable to picture myself killing someone. Suddenly, Brogan was pulling me toward the doors. Where are we going? I asked. To go have some quiet time out in the gardens. I would like to work on my totems for a bit in a more open atmosphere, and the fresh air will be good for us both. I leaned into his side as we walked, leaving the outpost and heading back toward campus and the gardens there. When was the last time Brogan and I had an afternoon like this to ourselves? We'd been so caught up since the training started and we'd moved to the outpost, there hadn't been a chance for us to pick up where we left off. An afternoon alone with him would be just what I needed, I hoped, to help get me out of this funk I found myself in. Chapter 14 Vori Sweat beating his brow, Brogan grunted from the effort. The totem pulsed with dark green energy pulled from the earth. I held my breath. He stepped back, shoulders sagging. The totem remained, tall and strong, filled with power. I let out a cheer from where I lounged nearby in the soft grass. See? Told you you'd get it. About damn time, he mumbled. And it's only what attempt number 50. Close. I smiled. But you did it. At least one of us can cross off an accomplishment for the day. The totem remained for a few more seconds, then it collapsed on itself and the magic returned to the ground. It had been a simple totem, meant to give temporary peace of mind to those near it. I felt more clear-headed than I had before, but as I glanced around campus hoping to catch a hint of Chaz, the calm sensation quickly disappeared. It had been hours since we'd seen him, and the night was quickly settling in around us. You could give it another go, Brogan suggested, following my worried gaze. And I'm sure he's fine, running around in the woods somewhere trying to clear his head. Yeah, you're probably right. I turned back to my current task, trying not to worry about Chaz, and cringed, shaking out my hands. And if it hasn't happened yet, I don't think it's going to. Maybe. Brogan came closer, wearing his charming smile of his that made my breath catch, remembering the few kisses we'd shared so far. You just need the proper motivation. Proper motivation? Yeah. Something to give you a boost. He helped me to my feet and then walked behind me. He reached around me and gently took my hands, holding them out before me. May I? Struggling to find the words, I nodded. His chest was hard against my back, and he was taller than me by a few inches. I fought the urge to lean back and rest against him, soaking in his warmth as the evening turned chillier. Not that I wasn't used to being cold, but any excuse to be closer to Brogan at that moment would have been fine with me. His hand slowly moved mine in random patterns, until I was laughing along with him, feeling the tension of the last few days leave my shoulders. See? Feeling better? I rolled my eyes and shook my head. A bit. Just a bit. Well that's not good enough. He turned me around in his arms so I faced him, and his hands rested on my hips instead. Mine found his shoulders. He lowered his head and when his lips found mine, I sank into him, letting myself enjoy the kiss I. His arms formed a protective cage, and I loved when he hugged me to him as the kiss turned intense. I smiled against his mouth. We broke apart, my cheeks flushed. His eyes glimmered with delight. How about now? I scrunched up my face, then I stood on my toes and pulled him back down for another kiss. Frost seeped from my hands to his back and he shivered. Oh sorry, I mumbled. He shook out the frost that covered his hair now too. No worries. And now? He arched a brow. Let's find out. I turned around and shut my eyes. Commander Blade told me at the beginning of my training that a familiar would come to me when I was truly open to being a mage and the burdens it entailed. I thought when I arrived I was ready, 
but it wasn't until this moment I sensed who I truly was meant to be. Now I knew who my dad was, knew a bit more about where I came from. I had a purpose here, and though I wasn't sure how well I'd actually do in fulfilling that purpose, I felt I was right where I belonged, with Chaz and Brogan. I had no doubt Brogan was to thank for helping me get to a better state, mentally, after all that transpired the last few days. His warmth centered my racing mind. I waited for that moment when my power rose within me. The marking on my hand pulsed in time with the beating of my heart. I didn't have to open my eyes to know my mark was glowing white and blue. Moran hadn't told me what my dad's familiar was, not wanting to influence my own. Though I wasn't sure I was ready to find mine yet, having one around would be helpful when it was time for our first battle. My gut nodded at the notion, but I pushed my anxiety aside and refocused my energy on finding the magical being that would be by my side forever. A familiar could appear in any form. The trick was not to imagine anything in particular and to let it take shape. The ground shook, followed by the sound of an explosion. My eyes shot open. Brogan cursed as he steadied me against him. A second explosion nearly sent us to our knees. What the hell is that? I looked around. A siren wailed, coming from the buildings behind us. I don't know, he said, holding tightly to my arm as if he was ready to protect me. I heard yelling across the campus as recruits ran back toward the buildings. Commanders belted out orders, but we were too far away to hear them clearly. The outpost's emergency lights flared to life. A tower of flame shot up into the sky from one of the buildings. A third blast lit up the forest behind us. I was torn on which way to go. My instincts told me to run into the woods. Then I realized what was happening. The barricade, I whispered. Someone's trying to break through. We need to alert the others. Brogan tugged me away from the trees as another blast lit up the darkness. We need to help the ones at the outpost. Then we heard the roar. It was Chaz's bear roaring in fury. We barely exchanged a glance, then we took off into the trees, both of us running. I willed my feet to move faster. Guess we weren't going to have to wait long for our first battle after all. They'd brought it to us instead, but I'd be damned if I was going to let them kill Chaz. Chapter 15 Brogan The unexpected explosions made me want to take Rory from the edge of the trees and get to the safety of the buildings. Until we heard Chaz's roar and a different instinct kicked in. We had to reach the other member of our team. She and I raced, ragged breathing competing with the pounding of my heart and adrenaline flooded my veins. A bright blue flash lit up the darkening woods. Rory got ahead of me, sprinting between trees. I picked up speed to reach her. Eventually, we were going to run into the barricade. Gunfire erupted, calls for more firepower and shouts. I cursed, lowered my head and charged into the chaos. We were trained to fight against other magic users, but gunfire was not something I expected. When I burst through a copse of dense trees, I froze, taken back by the violence before me. Rory yelled. Next to a slumped furry body, frost wind whipping around her. She directed the wind toward figures clad in black, military-style garb, charging through the very large, very visible crack in the barricade. The barricade sputtered and sparked, but whatever they were doing stopped it from repairing itself as it should. Her frigid winds pushed the intruders back but wouldn't hold them for long. I rushed to Rory's side, taking a spot next to her to help protect Chaz in his bear form. His fur was matted with blood and his breathing ragged. He'd been shot. At least once. I can't get him to shift back, Rory said in a panicked rush. He's hurt too badly. I glanced back at the crack and counted at least twenty attackers. How long can you hold them off? We couldn't carry Chaz, not like this, but if I could get a healing totem up, it might heal him enough to shift back and then we could drag him to safety. Rory shrugged. How long do you need? The self-conscious girl I'd met on our first day was gone replaced by a strong, determined one ready to do whatever she had to for her friend. Two minutes max. I turned to Chaz's body. More shouted orders came from the attackers. 
sirens still wailed behind us. I worried about those at the outpost and what they were facing, but there was nothing I could do to help them yet. We had to get Chaz out of here and warn Moran that the enemy had broken through. Any chance you can send a message back to the main buildings? Somehow. I asked as power rose within me and shot out of my arms into the earth. I'll try. She created another small vortex of icy wind, whispered something into it, then shot it behind us into the trees. Hopefully that reaches someone. Adrenaline rushed through my veins, and I used the extra energy to draw up the healing totem. It rose from the ground up through the leaves, glowing green with healing light. It washed over the ground and flowed over Chaz like a wave of water. Fire, a man yelled from the barricade. Rory cursed. Get down, she shouted. A wall of clear ice formed before us. A never-ending storm of bullets struck it in. I glanced at Chaz, willing his wound to heal faster as the ice was chipped away. Rory grunted, forming a second layer of ice, but we were running out of room. She snapped her fingers and her staff appeared in her hands, glowing fiercely. Shield your eyes. A white burst of frost sparked to life at her fingertips. She swirled it around. I squinted against the glow. Using so much strong magic was taking its toll, as I knew it would. When she faltered, I thrust out a hand and called on the natural essence of the ice, strengthening it as much as I could, adding my lightning to it as we both stepped forward and thrust our hands out. Just as the ice came down, the wall of frost and lightning rolled through the trees, straight for the attackers. They shouted in panic, I smirked, hoping the lightning burned at least a few of them. A growl came from behind us. Chaz was struggling to get up. His body vanished into a swirl of blue and green light. When the light cleared, Chaz in his human form replaced the bear. His right side was covered in blood. Brogan? he grunted. What? Rory. Can you walk? I hauled him, none too gently, to his feet with Rory's help. He winced, nodding. You shouldn't be here. Too late for that, Rory snapped, putting one of his arms over her shoulders. We have to move quick. It was much slower going with a wounded Chaz between us. Bullets ricocheted off the trees around us, and we ducked low, using what we could for cover. The edge of the woods was in sight, and the damned siren was still wailing. Footsteps crunched in the leaves behind us, and I knew we weren't going to make it. Another explosion blinded me and sent us falling to the ground, hunkering down below a few large boulders. We have no cover between here and the line. Chaz growled. Just leave me here. I'll do what I can to cover you. Not happening, I snapped as Rory shook her head. In this together, remember? You have to get out of here. You don't understand, he argued. They won't simply kill you if they capture you. Those are the cleansers. They broke through the barricade. Whatever power they have, I don't think we can fight it. We all ducked lower as more bullets slammed into the boulders. Damn it. I tried to peek, but barely caught a glimpse of the figures moving forward until Rory yanked me back before I lost my head. How did they get here without anyone knowing? Chaz gritted his teeth. I doubt, this is the only outpost they're attacking. There were more explosions from the main building, Rory told him. We're not sure how bad it is out there. More gunfire rang out, and it sounded like someone yelled the word grenade. You've got to be shitting me. I covered Rory the best I could with my body. It wasn't an explosion that erupted around us. There was a bright flash of white light, and then my ears were ringing. I couldn't see through the blurriness that filled my vision. Somewhere there was more yelling, and then rough hands grabbed hold of my arms and threw me to the ground. A heavy weight landed in the center of my back, and my hands were bound behind me. I called on my lightning, ready to blast the assholes away, but there was barely a spark. Get off me! Rory screamed. Get off! Rory! I yelled. Let her go! Chaz growled fiercely nearby. Get them up. We're short on time, a man grunted. Send the rest forward, we need to make this trip worthwhile. I was hauled to my feet and shoved along. I started to charge them and managed to get myself free. I took off running at the soldiers holding Rory and Chaz, 
tackling them to the ground in a heap. We were just getting to our feet when the intruders suddenly backed away. I saw a black object hit the ground near us. Chaz started to yell a warning. A massive electric shock exploded out of the damned object and pain tore through my limbs. Rory's scream tore me apart. Chaz growled curses, then bellowed in pain. When the shock was over, we fell to the ground, too weak to be of any use. Carry them if you have to. Let's move, a voice ordered. As my body was picked up and thrown over someone's shoulder, I winced at the excruciating pain flowing through me. Every jostle had me grinding my teeth and willing my lightning to return. But there was nothing. My connection to nature had been cut off. Why don't we just strip their power now? Someone asked. I stilled. Not yet. They wanted these three alive, the first man snapped. Who wanted us alive? In a matter of a few minutes, we were carried through the barricade that surrounded the campus and were thrown none too gently to the ground beside a large truck. Wait to load them until we get the other prisoners. Guard them. Four soldiers took up posts in front of us, and I shook out my head, trying to clear away the fuzziness filling my mind. Rory. I whispered. Chaz. Huh. Rory replied first. What did they do to us? That electric shock, Chaz murmured quietly, it cut off our power. Somehow. We have to get it back, I hissed under my breath. Rory pulled on her hands, struggling to get free of the zip ties. I shifted, so I was partially blocking her from view. Chaz did the same. Her eyes flickered blue as she fought to get her power back. Fruitlessly. We have to get out of here, she whispered. I don't know if I can use frost. I fumbled around again and managed to brush my fingers against hers, hoping to give her power. As if reading my mind, Chaz mirrored my movements. I felt a jolt of strength shoot through the three of us. Moran said we had to learn to work together as one. Whatever that electric shock did to us, I doubted it was permanent, since they hadn't stripped us of our powers. All we had to do was push past the block, overload it until we were back online. I focused on Rory, on the power that flowed within her and then shut my eyes. The storm wasn't hard to see in my mind's eye, but its power eluded me. My need for it was stronger than what was blocking my connection to nature. It had to be. I was not going to let us be taken captive. Not this early in the game. When Rory's hand grew cold in my grasp, I risked opening my eyes and saw the frost forming at her fingertips. A few sparks of lightning came to life and shot to her hands, then returned to me. Chaz's blue and green vortex flashed to life, and our powers flowed from one to the other, pushing back against the block until it weakened. What are you doing? One of the soldiers asked, raising his rifle. Stop. But we didn't. Instead, our power grew as our hands closed the circle. Suddenly, the hold it had on us was gone. The soldier yelled a warning and fired a shot at me. I flinched. The bullet hit the ice shield Rory had constructed. She shattered frozen plastic zip ties on her hands. Not nice, she snapped. With a yell, she thrust the ice forward. The shield expanded and took the four guards to the ground, trapping them beneath its weight. She snapped her fingers and her staff reappeared in her hands. She freed our hands and scrambled to get up. Without a word, the three of us turned to the line of trucks and other heavily armored vehicles parked among the trees. Rory raised her staff. I lifted my hands to the sky and Chaz lowered his to the ground. Lightning cracked across what had been a clear evening sky. I thrust the lightning toward the vehicles. It was joined by Rory's frost wind and a tidal wave of moss and vines. Everything was crushed in our combined powers path. Soldiers ran in a panic, yelling and hurrying to get free of the destruction. Bullets struck around us, prompting Rory to slam her staff to the ground forming an ice wall. Back to the barricade. She took off at a run. We were barely back inside the barricade schism when more bullets exploded around us. We dove to the side, behind another boulder. Not quickly enough. Rory shrieked. I hustled toward her. She held her side, blood soaking her shirt. 
damn, she gasped. I pressed my hands to the wound, hunkering down lower after hearing the order for more grenades. We have to keep moving. She nodded and with a grimace, sat up. I helped her move to where Chaz was motioning for us, staying low and behind the trees. An electric shock went off nearby but just missed us. We pushed on further. A bright flash blinded me momentarily. Something hot slammed into my left shoulder, taking me to the ground. Chaz yelled my name and then he growled in pain, collapsing beside me. Get them. A soldier ordered. And this time knocked them out. No, Rory whispered fiercely, scrambling to get back up. Rory, what are you doing? Her staff pulsed between bright blue and violet. The soldiers were moving in, but just as they were about to reach us, Rory's eyes turned violet, and the frost at her fingertips took on a shadowed appearance. The cold coming off her suddenly felt heavier, darker. Her white hair blew back from her face, and her power erupted from within. This was not the magic of a frost mage. Hell no. This was something different. Something much deadlier. She's a damned hybrid, I whispered surprised. Chaz nodded once. Her hand. Shit. Look at her hand. There on the back of her left hand was a scythe with a skull. Necromancer. Rory was a frost mage mixed with a necromancer. The way her ice had exploded that day in training, it all made sense now. As I looked at her face, into her eyes, the Rory I knew didn't appear to be present. Instead, this fierce woman bared her teeth and shot her hand to the ground. The soldiers formed a circle around us. Rory smirked. Surrender yourselves now, the soldier in front ordered. Do it, or we open fire. Rory still said nothing. The ground beneath us rumbled and groaned, breaking apart. The soldiers murmured. Skeletal remains of animals that died in the woods rose from the ground. They shook out their ratty bony bodies, and with a flick of Rory's finger, attacked our enemies. The soldiers yelled in panic, shooting at the dead things to no avail. Their bullets did nothing. Rory faltered, fighting to keep the power going, but it was clear it wasn't going to last long. She was losing blood, and using this much power was taking its toll. Chaz placed his hands down on the ground, next to Rory. I raised mine up to the night sky. The storm I dreamt of for so many nights, I imagined again now, felt myself get wrapped up in its chaos and danger, calling on it to let me use it now. More dark clouds moved in overhead as thunder rumbled in the distance. Lightning flashed, shooting toward my hands. It crackled over me in waves. Rory was back to using her frost magic and had combined it with Chaz's nature, bursting to life in a tumultuous wave of moss and thorny vines. I didn't stop to think about what we were doing, or how it would turn out. But somehow, I knew it would work. That this was why we had come to this outpost. I nodded at them and slammed my hands onto the sheet of moss-covered ice, lightning shot through it, joining their magic. It rose up like a tidal wave. Grenades exploded against it, but they barely stopped it as it built up in momentum and swarmed through the trees. Screams of pain met my ears, then the soldiers and the dead animals brought back to life were swept away by the storm the three of us created. With the soldiers dead or on the run, Rory sank to her knees, holding her side and gasping for breath. My shoulder was in agony. Chaz gritting his teeth urged, come on. He tugged on Rory, getting her to her feet. We have to go. We moved as fast as we could through the trees, tripping over roots and waiting for the next attack. None came. As we broke through the trees, smoke rose from the outpost and soldiers were rushing toward us, with Moran and Agnes in the lead. Chaz, Moran yelled. Help them, get them to safety, he ordered the soldiers. Rory collapsed suddenly, her eyes rolling back in her head. Agnes quickly fell to her side, resting her hand on her forehead. What happened out there? Necromancer, I explained, clutching a hand to my shoulder. She's a necromancer. Agnes and Moran exchanged a look. Then Agnes said, just like her father. What? Chaz and I snapped at the same time. Moran held up his hands. Get yourselves taken care of now. I will come to you later. How many are out there? Twenty, maybe more, Chaz reported. We took out most of their vehicles, 
and hopefully a good number of those bastards too. It's not magic they're using. No. You're sure? Yeah, damn sure. Electric shocks and flash bombs. It stuns our power somehow, cuts us off. Moran clenched his jaw, he nodded once, and then led the way into the trees, the rest of the soldiers trailing behind him. Agnes the outpost, Chaz asked. Who's hurt? Don't worry yourself over it. When he started to argue, she reached up and touched his forehead. He passed out, and then she turned to me with a calming smile. I welcomed being sent to sleep, ready to embrace a bit of serenity as my mind processed what the hell we just went through. Chapter 16 Chaz I jolted upright, looking around as the infirmary came into focus. Good, at least you're awake. I blinked hard, rubbing a hand down my face as I gave myself a minute to let my mind catch up. I'd been shot. No. Not just me. All of us. The attack. Brogan? You alright? He shrugged from the bed across from mine. Could be better. And Rory? I wondered why I had the strangest sensation that there was something I was forgetting about what happened out in the woods. Beside you. She hadn't woken up yet. I glanced to my right to find her lying in a bed, clothes bloodied. Like ours were. She appeared to be sleeping peacefully. I frowned, willing myself to remember every last detail of what occurred during the fight. I looked at her left hand. Necromancer, I whispered. That was real? It was. She's both it seems. No wonder her powers were flickering in and out. I threw back the sheet and swung my legs around to get out of bed. My side flared with pain and I lifted my shirt to find bandages. I wasn't sure how many times I'd been shot. There'd been so many explosions and the electric shock. Then the three of us using our powers together. And Rory tapping into her necromancer. I was about to get up and go to her, but the door to the infirmary opened, and Agnes and Moran entered. What do you think you're doing, he said angrily. Get your ass back in bed this instance. You are not well enough to get up and walk around. I reluctantly pulled myself back into bed. Agnes bustled around to Rory's bedside. She rested her hand to her forehead. Will she wake up soon? Brogan asked. I'm not sure. The power she used, she wasn't ready for yet. And being shot didn't help matters, Agnes added with a sigh. She needs time to heal. You all do. Moran paced through the infirmary, not meeting my gaze at all. The outpost, what happened to it? I asked him. Moran? The same time they attacked the barricade, another force assaulted the front gates, he said quietly. But they had help causing a diversion. Help? From who? Graham. He'd been corrupted, broke out of quarantine, and set off the first explosion that killed five of our soldiers. No, I whispered. He wouldn't. He did. He attacked everyone he came across, killed three more before he was taken down. I had to put a knife through his head to stop him. He hung his head, wiping at his hands as if they were still covered in Graham's blood. Where was the elite guard? I asked. They were at the front gate trying to hold off the attack, but they were taken captive. They were overwhelmed, and I couldn't get to them in time. He faced us once again as he grunted, they were captured. Then the attacking force retreated. I shook my head, not ready to believe it. And the other team. Taken two, he said solemnly. Which means you three are the only team we have right now. I do not want to put this burden on your shoulders, but I'm afraid we are at war. Our outpost was not the only one attacked last night. Many more lives have been lost. Brogan and I looked at each other intensely, the reality of our situation too serious to comprehend right then. I glanced at Rory, glad she was still unconscious. Our team is still one short, Brogan pointed out. How are we supposed to function? Rory is the answer to that question, Moran replied. She's a hybrid though. She'll have to pick one path or the other. Else her magic will continually fight itself, I countered. Won't it? 
Moran and Agnes shook their heads together. Her father was both mage and necromancer. Agnes ran her fingers lightly down the white locks of Rory's hair. His hair turned white too, though he dyed it so his wife would never notice. How was he both? That's too much strain on the soul, I argued. For most it would be, but he made it work. For the four of you to succeed, she will have to do the same. And a priest. Brogan shrugged. If her father was both, then their team had five. Technically. That will be your next task. Plus, continuing your training. If there is a priest you are compatible with, I will stop at nothing to find him or her. Until such time you three will work together and train. For war. I sank back against the pillows. War. The cleansers had declared war on the entire magical population, taken out our elite guard, and left us weakened, vulnerable. They were using weapons we'd never seen before that dampened our powers or stripped them from us completely. These were the people who killed my parents, took Rory's dad and Brogan's uncle. And now it was down to us to stop them. A shaman, a druid, and a mage with necromancer powers. I wanted to shut my eyes and imagine us making it out of this victorious, but my heart sank as I looked at Rory's sleeping form. Whatever came next, we were not going to get out of this unscathed. It's time for payback, I mumbled mostly to myself. Brogan nodded. Moran and Agnes looked far from pleased. They were worried, but that was an emotion I could not entertain. Now was a time for strength and courage. Now was a time to make my parents proud and not get myself killed in the process. Thank you for listening. This has been a Ciara Graves book. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new releases.